Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to the uh, regular meeting of the Board of Trustees for the Utah Transit Authority. Today's Wednesday, May the 26th of 2021, and I'm joined, I'm Carlton Christensen. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Beth Holbrook and Jeff Acerson. Uh, since this, uh, just as a reminder, for those who would like to make public comment, there is a registration link on our website, and we would certainly uh, invite you to do so. Um, since this is an all electronic meeting, we'll ask uh, Jenna Osler if she'll read the electronic meeting determination statement. Jenna. Thank you, Chair. This is the electronic board meeting determination statement. Consistent with the Utah Open and Public Meetings Act, as the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Utah Transit Authority, I hereby make the following written determinations in support of my decision to hold electronic meetings of the UTA board without a physical anchor location. One, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, conducting board and board committee meetings with an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the anchor location. Two, federal, state, and local health authorities continue to encourage institutions and individuals to limit in-person interactions. This written determination takes effect on May 12th, 2021 and is effective until midnight on June 11th, 2021 and may be reissued by future written determinations as deemed appropriate. Dated the seventh day of May, 2021, signed Carlton Christensen. Thanks, Jenna. Um, as, we, uh, we're, uh, as we go forward, we want to show some, um, I think there's one more slide, right, Jenna? Uh, we we want to show some um, uh, Artwork is part of our uh, Be Beautiful, uh, Utah Full, I should say, Community Student Art Competition. And and we've had some presentation on this and we just thought it would be great to show some of the art here. Uh, it will start appearing publicly here in the near future and as well as the, uh, those students involved uh, that participate in the program also getting a chance to write our system and, and um, See their artwork displayed throughout the system. So we're ex really excited about this uh, opportunity and, and for their reasons for indicating uh, why they like their neighborhood or their community. And I and, uh, think uh, this will be a great tradition as we go forward. Um, with that, we'll go to our uh, safety first minute. And with that, we welcome uh, our director, uh, Sheldon Shaw. Good morning, Sheldon. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Trustees. As always, appreciate the opportunity. I'm with UDOT here to present. I chose to go with uh, with UDOT's biggest safety campaign of the year, which is to highlight the 100 deadliest days. And unfortunately, those are between Memorial Day weekend, this weekend, and Labor Day, where we have nearly double the number of fatal crashes on our roadways. And so what UDOT asks us to do is to make sure that we're not distracted as we're driving, that we drive sober, make sure you wear a seatbelt. If you're distracted, please don't drive. And most importantly, probably is to obey the posted speed limits. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Sheldon. Appreciate that. Uh, great message. I, I, sh I, sh I failed to notice uh, when we were showing the artwork that that artwork belonged to Annabelle Lee, who's in grade 12 of uh, it and lives in South Jordan. I think it was listed on the statement, but wanted to make sure we pointed that out. Um, Jenna, is there any public comment uh, today? We do not have any members of the public who have joined us, Chair. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Also, would note that if there was any public comment received uh, previously, it's uh, distributed to the board, and we certainly welcome any comment uh, going forward. Uh, with that, we'll go to our consent agenda, and that includes the approval of our minutes from the May 12th, 2021 meeting. Uh, I'll entertain a motion unless there's any adjustments. Chair Christensen, I'll move uh, to approve the minutes. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth, uh, to approve the minutes. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes, thank you. Uh, next up is our agency report. And with that, we welcome our executive director, Carolyn Gannott, um, to give us our report. Uh, good morning, Carolyn. Good morning. Um, just I have one item um, that will be coming to you at the next board meeting, but because of 
uh, the timeliness of it. We did want to talk about a promotional fair request that we'll be doing that will allow UTA to temporarily offer offer ticket as fair contracts at no charge. And these are for those festivals as we as the economy begins to recover from the pandemic and we seek to bring, bring ridership back. Um, we've identified events as, as you know a key market and to have people come back to transit as well as celebrating at these festivals. And the ones that we will be bringing to you at the next board meeting um, are those that where we don't like provide surge service or additional service. So these are the ones where people can um, use the service that's out there today and existing. And those festivals will be the Pride Festival, which is the one that is happening um, uh, next weekend. Uh, the Hive Music Festival, the Beer Festival, Salt Lake Comic Convention or Fan X, and the Utah State Fair. So you'll see something come back to you um, with that. But with the Pride Festival that's happening sooner, we wanted to sort of have the nod today. We'll be coming back on that. But what we would be doing is entering a special event pass agreement um, with those event hosts um, that meter agreed to the following criteria. And that's it, that the host enters into a formal contract with us that they must meet our ticket requirements um, that we serve um, as the, the ticket will be the fair media for that day. Um, and the tickets will be printed with the UTA logo, logo where we're able to, if, unless the timeliness doesn't allow it. Um, and then we, we would get in-kind marketing and promotion. And this is something that we would be doing for this year. Um, all services would be available for the exception of ski bus, which we aren't running right now. Um, uh, the PCLC Connect service and paratransit service. So just to let you know, that would be something that we'll be bringing to you at the next board meeting, but we wanted to give you just a heads up today regarding um, uh, the Pride Festival, which happens um, the earliest of those five events. We will be coming back to you with Ticket as Fair on other events um, and uh, working with those hosts as well. And those have, are more in line of where we provide additional service on top of what we already provide normally out there. So we'll be coming back to you in, in with those. Um, the Ferris Department will be coming back um, to the board over the next um, few weeks as well. So I just want to um, come uh, let you know that that this is something that we are proposing to the board. Any questions for Carolyn? Carolyn, I have a question. Um, are we doing this for, um, I know you mentioned events where we're already running existing service, which makes a lot of sense to me to kind of highlight both the event and in our service. Um, are we, like I know that Ogden, downtown Ogden does some stuff and are we looking at events like that or and reaching out or are we kind of announcing it so that hopefully they'll reach out to us? Yeah, so a, a lot of it has to do with whether you have a ticket or not. So if it's something is open and, and open to the public, we're trying to figure out how do we handle those. So those will be another area we've talked about promotional fairs, maybe, you know, the, the adults pay the, the all youth ride free, things like that we might be looking at. So parades, those types of things that are more open, but continue to do promotions that support people taking transit to the events that are now opening up after uh, over a year in hiatus. So um, this will be, I think, um, you know, something we can do with the community as well. Any other Thanks. Questions? I think it will be great. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Yes. Uh, no, no. I just jumped right in, but I, I appreciate that. I think that that is a good strategy and I'm excited to see how that uh, plays out. Other questions for Carolyn on this one? Let me just confirm just so that because uh, they're going to be coming back. Does anybody have any concerns with them going forward I, with the promotions? So not seeing any, Carolyn. So thank you for that update on that. Oh, issue. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, that's That concludes my report for today. Oh, okay. Thanks, Carolyn. Appreciate that. That'll be exciting. It's exciting to see the events come back. And and uh, you were kind enough to share some pictures yesterday. And it was nice to see platforms actually have um, full occupancy on them. So that's it's good, great. Um, our next item up is a report from our pension committee and, and uh, Jeff serves uh, on our behalf on that committee. And uh, Jeff, do you want to give us an update? I'd be happy to. Uh, we have a few slides that uh, we've brought forward. Uh, most of it just showing some of the detail. Uh, and maybe I can just preface it with we had a very very good return on the investment this last year. 
Uh, and you can see some of the positive numbers here. The assets of as of January 1 of last uh, was 241. Uh, as of December of last year, it increased to 279, almost 280 million. The green bars there show what was put in the contributions, the 24.4. And then the investment return was 33.8 which was just incredible. Uh, Milliman and uh, anyway, as Bill and the other committee members were there, uh, you know, we can take a deep breath and hope it continues in that way. The gray, the gray bars show uh, what the monthly benefits were and then the lump sum uh, payouts that were done there. And the administrative uh, expenses were quite, well, very low. So uh, next slide. This is a table that shows um, just a little bit more detail. Uh, the assets went from 241 to two, almost 280. Uh, the funding, uh, the liability that we have, the actuarial accrued. Uh, the unfunded liability decreased, uh, which is the right direction we want to go. It shows the funding ratio, which was at about 67%. We increased it to about 73%, which uh, is in line with the vision of trying to have it fully funded, I believe by 2032 or 34, I'm trying to remember. Um, and the target contribution rate um, is stated there. And, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's 2034 is when we're hoping to have it fully funded. Uh, the next slide will show, um, if you can go to that, these are just some projections showing uh, uh, the return assumption rate. Uh, and obviously we're, we're well on target uh, based upon the return. If, if the return decreases, even if it uh, decreases by a, a quarter percent, uh, we're still, and we don't think necessarily that's going to happen, but uh, you can see we're well within the range of being fully funded. We, we may arrive at that target earlier, depending on how the return is on the market. Um, but we're, our projections are still uh, very founded in what we're trying to do. Now, there are some assumptions that we, as a committee, talked about. Uh, there were some recommendations possibly of changing the rate, uh, decreasing it. And this shows uh, what that would do potentially if we were to decrease that. The recommendation is really up to us whether or not we want to decrease it. And Bill, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. Uh, I know there was some talk about uh, preloading it uh, and, and achieving that goal earlier. Uh, that was an option. There's also, if we go to the next screen, you can see uh, some of the uh, action items for the committee. Uh, we're trying to decide uh, basically if if the target that was sent to, uh, set in 2013 by the, that time the board was to be fully funded by 2034. Uh, you know, not that we can predict what the future will be, but we're well on target to do that and probably do it earlier than later. Uh, but that's a discussion I think uh, that we want to have as trustees and then as a, as a pension committee to determine if we want to reevaluate that because that's that's not quite ten years ago. But it's it's uh, we may want to have a discussion as a as a board and then as a pension committee to see if we want to adjust that. Uh, you know, if investment return assumption is changed. Then it's going to it's going to change the target and the actuarial equivalent interest rates and assumption. So there's a lot of discussion, and the committee felt like maybe we need to have a review of that and then make some recommendations to the board of trustees um, because it's been long enough that maybe we can adjust that. So that's just kind of a general thought. Bill, is there anything more you feel uh, the trustees might benefit from from your? No, no, I think you did a great job, Trustee Asterson, and uh, I think the bottom line is that we'll be reviewing that policy that was adopted in 2013 and 
and potentially looking at that issue of the uh, contribution rates. But overall, I think, uh, you, you know, you, you could have said a better, great performance and uh, really happy with the direction it's headed. So if we can repeat that, which we have no control. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that, that is uh, certainly encouraging. I, you know, I, if we could only be so fortunate as to have those kind of returns every year, then you'd, you know, maybe you would re rethink that rate. I, I got to think that there's going to be some years in the not too distant future where we could see a less than uh, aspect and it'd be nice to be able to stay on course with a little bit of reloading from the good returns that we've had. Um, but I certainly think it's worth evaluating and, and, uh, you know, it has been a while and, but I, right now I wouldn't make any major changes unless something drastically changes or we think there's, it's to our advantage substantially one way or the other. I, anyway, those are my initial blush thoughts. Yeah, there, there were not strong recommendations from from uh, the ones that consult with us. Uh, they felt that we could stay the course or we could make an adjustment. It was really kind of up to us based upon uh, where we want to achieve full uh, funding of the of the pension program. Beth, it looked like you might have a comment. Yeah, I thanks, Carlson. Um, I, I kind of am of the same mind. I kind of think that it's not an unrealistic uh, funding ratio deadline. And so I, I knowing that there are fluctuations and uncertainties in the market, and that is a historical reality, I think that it's probably wise to kind of just keep it in that same vein. I don't know that making changes is going to really um, exponentially increase the value of it. I think it kind of looks it's kind of doing a little bit of both right now, which I think is a good place to be in. Well, thank you for your comments, Carlton. That yeah. concludes my report. Jeff, I, uh, it, it, I, I assume in those actuarials, they're taking into account. I know that I, I don't, Cliff is probably a harsh range, but there's a lot of people who started at UTA kind of at the same band. And I would imagine there'll be sort of a wave of retirement in the not too distant future. I, I, that's taken into account in those actuarial assumptions, right? That, that's correct. I mean, they, they chart everything and they anticipate, uh, they can't anticipate everything because there are some fluctuations, but that's all part of the process. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Well, thanks. Thanks for that report, Jeff. Appreciate it. And thanks, Bill, for um, your efforts on it as well. Um, all right, we'll move on to item C, which is our safety and security report. This is part of our oversight program, uh, Utah State Oversight Program. And with that, we welcome uh, back Sheldon Shaw as well as Jim Golden uh, with UDOT. All right, thanks, Chair. If I could just take a few minutes to talk briefly about the state safety oversight program and about Jim Golden in particular. Um, if I had to pick the two best safety partners we have here at UTA, I would answer that by saying the state safety oversight program and Utah Operation Lifesaver and Jim Golden is highly involved in both of those. Um, over the years, we've developed a very collaborative and proactive relationship with Jim Golden and his team, and he has helped us improve safety at UTA. Some of the things that he does is he reviews our, our investigations from incidents that happen in our system. He reviews and improves corrective action plans. Um, over the past year, he and his team have done a great job in reducing the backlog of corrective action plans here in our track system. And he's been very proactive about that. He assists in safety certifications and he's right now highly involved in the moving of the airport station. Um, and then in this last couple of days, and we've been working on the dates to do our triennial audit. Him and his team come through once every three years and do a very in-depth audit of our tracks light rail system. Out of that, there will be a number of findings and recommendations. And, and his team is experienced and they have um, they have input from about half the properties across the United States that they also do audit set. And so the team that he brings in here is very experienced and brings some best practices to us, which helps safety improve here at UTA. On a personal level, Jim is a member of the, is a board member of Operation Lifesaver Utah. 
And in addition to that, he's a volunteer presenter. And so he's out there doing rail safety presentations in high school driver's ed classes, getting the message out there and preventing accidents. He's highly involved in Rail Safety Week. And in September, you'll see that the UDOT will have messaging over our freeways that talk about rail safety. And that's because of his efforts. And in fact, if I um, schedule a safety blitz at, from six to eight in the morning at say ballpark station, Jim will show up there in an orange vest and help us pass out swag and get that safety message out there. And so all that being said, if um, Jim and his team find something that we are not doing well, he holds our feet to the fire like he should and he helps us improve. And so with that, I'd like to turn the time over for Jim Golden and his annual presentation. Uh, Sheldon, I, I appreciate that. And uh, uh, I think you can see a little bit of the collaboration that we have. I appreciate Sheldon's safety minute this morning, you know, kind of uh, tying that or connecting that link between UDOT and UTA. Um, you know, UDOT's goal is zero fatality, zero crashes, zero, you know, zero everything. If we could get to it, that would be our, our ultimate goal. And of course, transit becomes a very big part of that. And uh, Sheldon is an excellent partner. Chair uh, Sheldon is also the chair of Operation Lifesaver, the board there, and uh, just a, an excellent safety uh, mind and uh, and a good safety uh, partner. We, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the chance to talk to the board just briefly. Um, as part of our annual safety certification with the Federal Transit Authority, so the, or the Federal Transit Administration, excuse me, FTA, um, I, I submitted our 2020 report back in March um, and also uh, prepared the report to the governor. And then this, uh, as part of that certification, is my report to the, the Board of Trustees. And so I appreciate this opportunity to, to be with you today. Um, <clears throat> uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so UDOT was asked to be uh, the state safety oversight uh, years ago. We'll, we'll talk just briefly about our program, talk about a few key activities we've been doing and maybe some highlights if there were any in 2020. Uh, we'll try to go get through a pandemic uh, with a state safety oversight perspective. We'll go with that. So uh, next slide. <clears throat> As I mentioned, UDOT, Utah, UDOT was asked to be the SSOA or the state safety oversight agency for Utah. And we've been doing that uh, ever since uh, tracks began. We only basically only have uh, for state safety oversight, it's just the tracks line and the Sugar House streetcar are the only lines that we watch for that. So the bus and uh, front runner are handled differently. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, UDOT has a, a program standard, uh, the PTAS that the UTA has, that now has approved as per 39 CFR part 674 um, is based on this program standard that UDOT provides. And Sheldon and I work together. Uh, we look through this, make a few changes each year. Um, the PTAS is also updated. We review that. Um, as Sheldon mentioned, I have an excellent, uh, excellent team. We have a, a Transportation Resource uh, Associates, TRA, out of Philadelphia. They represent uh, just about half of the SSOAs in one form or another across the country. Uh, they do an excellent job of helping us keep our program standard up to date, and the PTAS. Uh, follows right along with that. And um, that basically defines our authority um, here in the state. And the good thing is that we have such a good working relationship. I feel that this this happens almost every year with a like clockwork and uh, very easy to get this approved. And Sheldon's team is great to make any changes that we request. Next slide. So our, our key program activities, uh, regularly we meet together. Obviously the year 2020 was very different when it came to meeting together. Um, we've done learned to do this all remotely. We've done, uh, you know, we continue to talk regularly. Um, we did do our, uh, um, our hours of service audit. I think I have that coming up later, but we did that virtually this year. Um, we're able to get through that. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> As Sheldon mentioned, if there are any uh, events that happen, we define those as accidents, incidents, or uh, other sorts of events. Uh, we do an investigation on those and just make sure that uh, that we we have the system as safe as as we can be. Um, we review the PTASP and we also review the emergency preparedness plan and work with those uh, those safety partners within UTA. To make sure that those. Uh, uh, documents are also updated and and, uh, and approved. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, I mentioned the, the hours of service audit. We conducted that uh, virtually this last year um, through that audit, which um, is becoming um, 
quicker and smoother every year thanks to a lot of the efforts um, in UTA. Uh, we only had one finding this year. Uh, we conducted the audit in October. That finding was recognized as just a training um, uh, need that was quickly corrected and uh, resolved with the new training at the beginning of the year. And we closed that, uh, closed that corrective action plan in February. So excellent performance um, by UTA in our hours of service audit for last year. Next slide. Um, and I, I noticed an error here. We've got the in 2019, that should be, that, that should not be there, but UDOT tracked 43 events um, in 2020. Um, that was a that was a substantial decrease from over 60 in, in 2019. Um, you know, obviously our exposure was less for a, a, a good portion of 2020. We were running, you know, uh, half hour headways. We weren't didn't have quite as much exposure out in the system uh, as we've had in the past. Um, and we'll admit that we'd like to take credit and just say we decreased our events by 20 per, by 20 events in one year, but we know that there was probably some uh, some factors involved with that. But um, many of these events um, involved um, autos that make or cars that make a left hand turn in front of a train. And having noticed that and working at that, we worked with um, Avenue Consulting. Uh, as the SSO, we issued a special assessment to UTA, gathered data on these left turn accidents and had um, Avenue Consulting uh, do a, a review of that and provide us with a report with some recommendations. And um, as Sheldon mentioned, you know, we, we try to look for opportunities to um, improve safety. The good thing on this was uh, they got us some good, good data, gathered that and kind of put it in a nice concise report. And as far as FTA is concerned, we were able to spend some of our grant money uh, when we weren't spending as much this year, we were able to spend it toward this uh, special assessment, which is, which is very good, uh, a good step on, on our part. So uh, the next slide. Um, uh, yes, Beth, go ahead. I do apologize. I know you're kind of on a roll and I just wanted to ask just a quick question. You mentioned the consultant that did the safety studies. Uh, those um, automobile accidents that are usually making illegal left turns or turning into the train. Um, was that data, is that something that can be implemented for additional safety measures or is it um, data so that we kind of understand habits more? I guess that's where I was kind of confused. Could you maybe elaborate just a little bit? You bet, you bet. Um, so what we did, we had this consultant come in. We have, uh, and, and UTA does a great job of tracking all of their accidents. Um, and we went back, Sheldon, I'm trying to remember, I think we went back five years, is that correct? Five That's years right. on it. We gave you yeah. five years for the data. Yeah, we went back five years on our data to look and see how many of these accidents were happening to see if there were any trends. And one of the interesting things is obviously uh, those, those Particular types of accidents only happen where we have, uh, you know, left turn signs uh, that uh, or no left turn signs, excuse me. Uh, they were able to go out, take the data and look at that, put that into the report. But then they also went out and did some observation, um, sent some people out to look and see, because with every accident that happens, how many close calls are there? How many people are there that their behavior is such that they're making that left turn? And, you know, nine times out of 10, maybe 99 times out of 100, they make that safely and think, oh, this is fine, I can do this. But then one time they forget to watch their blind side and don't recognize the train coming up from behind them. Um, some of the study, they noticed that uh, we have, we're not totally consistent. If we have leading lefts or lagging lefts, which basically means like the left turns happen at the beginning of a, of a signal cycle or toward the end. And many times also, if a train comes through and it skips a cycle with that signal, um, there are people that think or assume that, oh, because the um, there must be something wrong with the system. And then they would make an illegal movement thinking that they were okay doing that because something must have gone wrong with the system, even though the system was actually performing well. And those recommendations we took to took to heart. Um, uh, Sheldon's got a copy of that, and uh, we've gone to our uh, signal people. This is not just a UTA issue. This is also a UDOT issue because a lot of those signals are controlled by the UDOT, UDOT TOC. And so this is great information for those groups to kind of come together, 
And I think one of the keys will just be consistency. And But you're absolutely right. Uh, um, it did kind of talk about uh, more about behavior, you know, the behavior of drivers and how can we make it consistent so that they know what to expect out in the system. Does that help? That, that's helpful. I appreciate that because that is obviously the more nuanced and, and challenging um, uh, scenario to to change behavior, right? And so, but it's helpful, I think, to understand too that the mindset says that, oh, well, if it didn't do it this one time, it, it, the system is broken, as opposed to you know. So that that's an interesting thing. But anyway, thank you. I appreciate that. That's helpful. No, no, no problem. Thanks for thank you for the question. I think, yeah, if we're consistent, people know what to expect and hopefully they, they won't make those risky movements. Uh, they'll know that, okay, the cycle's coming back to me and I'll be okay. Um, especially, I think, Sheldon, they were encouraging us to, to go with leading lefts, leading left turns throughout all of our system if we could because they saw the most problems with the lagging lefts, left turns. That's so correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, we, we mentioned a little bit about uh, <clears throat> the airport extension. Um, the activation committee has begun to meet. Uh, we're looking forward to this. Um, I actually tried this out uh, a couple of weeks ago from the airport. I um, was able to take the shuttle over to the old station and, and, uh, and then take the green line back home and then front runner down to, to my place from there. Um, it's going to be nice when this is all done, and we're we're looking forward to this. My consultant TRA, they have they're kind of walking us through this process. Uh, we meet monthly, and that will become more frequent as we get closer to kind of our October time frame for opening that that up. Um, just uh, the requirements that we have there for you know just review to make sure that we're safe and ready to open when that when that time comes. Uh, that's our involvement there. And uh, UTA does a great job of including us in those meetings so that we're prepared and ready when that comes. We're looking forward to that. Next slide. <clears throat> so back in uh, back in July of 2019, if we can remember back that far, um, FT actually came out and did an audit of, of the UDOT SSO program. Um, it was over a year, so it was December of 2020 when they finally released uh, um, the report to UDOT and found only two findings in that report. Um, th this, uh, this audit was done, it's, it's an audit of UDOT and the SSO, but it very much involved UTA. Uh, the Federal Transit uh, Administration was here, their representatives were here, went through the system with us. Um, UTA was an excellent host. Um, both of those findings that came were, were really quite minor, if you ask me. One was uh, how we were spending our money. Um, they give us a grant to fund the SSO program, and we, I guess we weren't spending money fast enough, which is kind of an interesting problem to have. But uh, that special assessment was funded by part of that grant, and so that's part of the good news that came from that is that we were able to spend some of our SSO money on that. And we gave them a, a rolling average looking forward uh, and then how we anticipate three to five years coming up of spending. And uh, we look forward to getting things back to normal. And, um, but still we're not spending as much as, they, as much as they would like us to. We've given them a report on that and also on the UDOT training and how we're uh, complying with that. And both of those findings have been addressed and have been uh, accepted now by FTA as of a couple of weeks ago and will be closed. And so, um, Sheldon mentioned, you know, the findings and some of the corrective actions we have done over the last year or so. We've really made a lot of progress, and this is a great tribute to the safety team at UPA, really um, just kind of approaching some of these corrective actions, seeing them closed out. Um, I will mention that uh, um, <clears throat> I work a lot with Travis King and with Tina Bartholomew. Um, Tina was asking me a question the other day about some of these caps. We had a cap that was that we were carrying along in our system. So a cap is a corrective action plan. It was uh, it was noted in 2012 that that should be a corrective action plan. It was to put a tunnel up by the U of U for uh, pedestrians to go under the rail so that they could avoid um, uh, contact with the train up there. Um, obviously, U UTA had no no uh, authority to really go up and put a tunnel in up at the U of U, but for some reason we had carried that cap for about seven or eight years. 
And it just kept on coming up year after year. We finally decided to write down why we couldn't do that and close that cap. And that seems like a silly little paperwork thing, but it sure feels good to look at our list and see that we're managing that a little bit better and that we have the authority to actually do what we say we're going to do. So uh, with that, I believe that's, uh, my, that's my last slide. My contact information is there, but I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, now or in the future if you have any for me. Jim, thank you uh, for your comments. Um, aside from the left uh, hand turn issues, um, were there any other sort of patterns that were of concern to you that either just are sort of creeping into the scene or um, or that seem to be persistent uh, even though they're being remedied? I just wondered if there's a nature beyond that left hand turn issue. Um. You know, we have, uh, I've been in this position now for uh, close to, well, a little over four years. And we've been looking for, you know, something, some sort of a pattern or something like that. We really have a hard time finding one. Okay. There's uh, a lot of our accidents that happen are, are quite rare. I'd say if there's one concern, and I know that UTA is addressing this internally as well, and that would probably be the intended deaths, the suicides that we have to deal with. Yeah. And uh, I've been impressed with the proactive approach, the whole polls and different things that UTA is putting out there to try to address that that issue. But I think over the last year or so, Sheldon, um, the only fatalities on the system, I know in 2020, there were two fatalities. They were both intended deaths. We had one serious, yeah, yeah, one serious accident with a Suburban that got us like eight serious injuries. <laughs> Other than that, um, you know, we really haven't seen a pattern and we really feel pretty good about how things are going. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, other questions from the board? Yeah. Not seeing any. Sheldon, thank you. And, and we appreciate this dialogue and, and the proactive nature of it. So thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, guys. Um, we'll move then to resolutions and the first item up for us is a resolution granting contract and expenditure authority for parts inventory purchases. I know we had some discussion in an earlier meeting uh, kind of related to this and this I think opens up a new opportunity that will help move things along. Troy. Thank you, Chairman Christensen, Board of Trustees. Yes, this resolution will look very similar to a resolution we passed in April. The one Sorry, in April. I, you're, you're a little light in the, maybe just talk just a little louder or something. Something wasn't quite picking you up. Can you hear me now? That's a little better. Okay. I'll try to get as close as possible. So yes, this resolution will look very similar to the one we passed in April. April focused on payroll and utility type purchases that we do for over $200,000 that typically don't have a purchase order or a procurement pattern. These ones are focused on just inventory purchases. So None of these vendors that we're putting on this resolution have, have actually gone over $200,000 in disbursements, but we just wanted to bring it to the board's attention that we do do business with about 26 vendors are listed on this resolution, and we do it in an individual bid by bid situation. So we issue multiple purchase orders throughout the year, all under $150,000 a piece. And sometimes some of those purchase orders get clumped together and disbursements happen, could happen over 200,000. So, this resolution basically gives us the authority to continue that practice of bidding out parts inventories and allowing for the disbursement of 200,000. I take it that these are the vendors that you're referring to? Correct. Sorry. Next slide. <laughs> There's two pages of slides. It makes up 26 vendors. We did add five vendors at the end. They haven't actually had two hundred thousand dollars worth of purchases but there is potential in future years for this to go over two hundred thousand our intent is every year to bring back this specific resolution granting us disbursement authority for inventory parts and we'll update the amounts each year based on what we did the previous year great uh questions uh from the board not not seeing any um this makes a lot of sense, and uh, and uh, I think this is is a good transparent process as well. So thank you for your efforts there. With that, I would entertain a motion on uh, this particular resolution. 
Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve resolution R2021-05-01, granting the contract and expenditure authority for parts inventory purchases. I'll second that. I have a motion from Beth, uh, seconded by uh, Jeff to approve the resolution. Can I ask for a roll call? Trustee Holbrook. Aye. Trustee Acerson. Aye. Chair Christensen. Aye. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Troy. That brings us to resolution uh, item number B, which is a resolution delegating approval authority for certain described task orders under the on-call task ordering maintenance and repair contract uh, for UTA uh, for 2021. With that, I would welcome Mary DeLoretto and Dave Hancock. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, trustees. Yes, this resolution is regarding our on-call maintenance contract with Stacy Whitbeck. It was executed in January of this year, and we've already come to you with a number of task orders on that contract. And this resolution has identified a number of those task orders that we know will be um, conducting or completing this year and the estimated cost for each of those. And I'm going to turn this over to Dave Hancock to discuss those different task orders that we would like approval authority to, um, to issue those contracts on. So Dave, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, yeah, thank you, Mary and, and Chair and, and Board of Trustees. A uh, little background on the contract. Stacy and Whitbeck was awarded the on-call maintenance contract earlier this year. Scope of the work is to perform uh, major maintenance and transit construction tasks on UTA infrastructure. Uh, we are asking the board to approve a, a resolution that would allow the executive director to approve task orders for the following anticipated tasks at prices no greater than the not to exceed amount showing in the following exhibits. Uh, so the task orders will be subject to price verification and an independent cost analysis. The task order scope of work will be determined uh, by an executive at the director level or higher that it is within the scope of the basic task ordering agreement. And all task orders will be governed by the terms and conditions of the basic uh, task ordering agreement approved by the Board of Trustees when we approved the contract earlier this year. And then all task orders will be subject to uh, legal review and approval. So next slide. So some of the task orders will be uh, curve replacements, embedded curve replacements, similar to what we did last year on South Temple Main Street. Um, the, uh, and the locations are going to be two curves at the south end of the stadium platform on 500 South, be two curves on the north end of the stadium uh, platform that is gonna, that kind of goes into the South Campus Road, and then two curves on Mario Capecchi Drive and South Campus Drive. So six curves in all for the light rail curve replacement task order. Uh, and not to exceed $2.7 million for those six curves. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these curves are approaching the end of their useful life and uh, require replacement. And the work will include demolition of the existing curve, the rail and the embedded concrete uh, will be replaced as well. And then this new replacement will include restraining rail, which is a new safety feature that, that wasn't uh, around when we when we originally built the line. Next slide. The next uh, task orders that we are targeting uh, for the task order contracts are operator relief firms. And these are this work will include installing a prefabricated building, a concrete pad, a footing, utilities. And this is at 3900 South and Wasatch Boulevard and the University Medical Center. So uh, next slide. Uh, this task order will be for gap filler on front runner stations. This is a safety issue that, is, that has been brought up. Uh, and this project uh, basically addresses the gap between the station and the front runner passenger car. And then the station locations will be identified once we have chosen the material and uh, we, we know the costs to procure that material. And then this gap filler will match the product installed on the new vineyard station. 
Uh, next slide. And then uh, lastly, we'll talk about grade crossings. We have brought several of these to you this year. Uh, I think everybody knows that uh, we need to replace five to seven grade crossings per year if we want to stay in a state of good repair with with our grade crossings. We have completed four already with a fifth scheduled to take place this weekend. So with these uh, three grade crossings on this uh, resolution, it will get us to eight uh, for the year. So we'll be a little bit over our, our goal. Uh, so we will be doing Winchester Avenue and 3200 West on the red line. And Winchester Avenue is, is on the blue line at approximately 6400 South. Uh, next slide, please. And then the last one will be 8120 80, South. Uh, it says red line, but this is actually on the blue line as well. Uh, so those are those are the three grade crossing replacements. So we have the six curves, the two operator relief buildings, the gap filler, and then the grade crossings on this resolution. Uh, are there any questions? This is the last slide. Are there any questions on this resolution? No, I, it, it makes uh, sense, and and um, you know, and I also I, I'm sure it helps in. Um, making sure you can move this work along in a timely way. So I, I know there was a lot of efforts to get this coordinated and bring the, these numbers together. And uh, they seem like a very reasonable approach. Um, however, let me turn to board members if they have questions or concerns with what's being proposed. I don't really have a question or a concern about what's being proposed. I just kind of was curious, like, um, on the grade crossing replacements, for instance, how I guess all of these all of these amounts that you're looking at, um, we know that there is a, a challenge in terms of obtaining um, materials and supplies right now um, for multiple reasons and, and costs have risen substantially. Are these numbers addressing that or is this just giving us a, an approximate baseline to work from? Yeah, th this is an approximate uh, baseline, but it is uh, a not to exceed amount. And so we, we have taken, you know, historical data and costs and added uh, a, a factor, a safety factor, contingency factor onto that. And so as we negotiate with the contractor, we're, we're confident that their prices will come in lower than what we've estimated here on, on these slides. That's helpful. I know that that is part art and part science on these things, and that's a, I appreciate that. It's it's just a difficult time um, for everyone, I'm sure. Thanks. Any other questions on this? Seeing, uh, thank you, Dave and Mary, on this item. Um, seeing that, and not, no other questions, I would entertain a motion on this particular resolution. Chair, I will go ahead and make that motion. Resolution R2021-05-02, delegating approval authority for certain described task orders under the on-call task ordering maintenance and repair contract um, for 2021. Second. I have a motion from uh, Jeff, seconded by Beth, um, to approve the resolution uh, discussed. Uh, I'll ask for a roll call. Jesse Acerson. Aye. Jesse Holbrook. Aye. Chair Christensen. Aye. The vote is unanimous. Thank you. Great. Um, looks like we'll move forward to uh, contracts, disbursements, and grants. And the first item up is a uh, maintenance of way of replacement vehicles uh, associated or from Ken Garf, West Valley Ford. And looks like Dave, we're coming back to you on this item. Yeah, yep, yep, coming back to me, thank you. Uh, this request is for a replacement of 15 non-revenue service vehicles for the MOW department. This is for 12 trucks and three small SUVs. Usually the non-revenue service vehicles do not come to the board because they're kind of purchased singly or separately. This one happened to be, uh, we went out to bid for these uh, 15 vehicles on a state contract uh, Ken Garf of West Valley was the lowest bidder, and so we we uh, requested the vehicles from them. Uh, 
So we are asking the board to approve the replacement of 15 non-revenue service, service vehicles for MOW in the amount of 530,609 to Ken Garth West Valley. Are there any, any questions? Did they have them in stock? <laughs> They, they, they did. Uh, that was my question ones. too. Yeah. <laughs> the, these are ones that they had, uh, they had on the lot. And so they were able to provide them and, and group them together and, and give us a PO for them. So we were, we were pleased with that. Okay. We were in desperate need of, of trucks in the MOW department. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. You're fortunate then. Um, other questions or concerns? Seeing that, I would entertain a motion on this particular contract. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the contract for the maintenance of way replacement vehicles with Ken Garf West Valley Ford. I'll second that. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff, uh, to approve the contract. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dave, for your help on those. We'll next move to a contract uh, in regards to bus real-time digital signage equipment with, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Dactronics. And with that, we welcome um, uh, G.J. Uh, Labonte. Thank morning, you. G.J. Good morning, um, trustees. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the, uh, the contract before you is uh, part of a larger program that are, that's associated with uh, a CMAC grant that was awarded to UTA um, that's uh, its execution year um, is coming up. And the uh, agreement in front of you is for purchase of 23 digital electronic signs from the Dactronics company. Um, these will, it, this will purchase 23 signs that will be used at uh, eight different bus hub locations. I should state that the uh, terms of the CMAC agreement were that these signs were to be um, the, uh, used with the bus, the UTA's bus system only. So these, the funds can't be expended for real-time signage in association with any of the rail network. Um, the uh, total grant amount is one point, um, about one point five million dollars. UTA has a seven. Uh, about a 7% match on that for about uh, $100,000. Um, this again is, is just a contract for the hardware uh, for these signs. We will be assembling another RFP to go out for construction and installation of the signs. Um, the locations are listed on uh, the memo there um, and they will again be at the bus hubs at these intermodal locations. Um, it's a three-year agreement with an option for uh, two one-year extensions uh, with an additional 100 signs um, offered by Dactronics um, at the agreed price. Um, I think that's about the extent of the details associated with the with the agreement. DJ, what's the nature of the hardware itself? I mean, is it, um, I know it's in some of our current like track signage, it's a fairly, cryptic's a little bit harsh, but it's a very rigid digital format. Is, will these signs give us some flexibility down the road with programming and enhancements that might come our way? Yeah, um, actually, that was one of the criteria we we uh, put into the RFP was that flexibility for um, variability on the line heights of the of the signage itself. We can we can actually introduce colors. We can introduce graphics um, onto these signs themselves. Um, so yeah, one of the procurement uh, requirements was more flexibility with the. Um, capability to program these. In the beginning, what we will do is use the exact same code that we are currently using for the real-time information on the rail platforms and just extend it over to, you know, the bus side of things, connecting to the bus AVL systems um, before we start sort of experimenting with some of the other um, 
opportunities with the technology. Any other questions on this contract? Do we anticipate um, at some point getting all of our, um, all, more of our core bus route, if you will, or some identifying characteristic that will create all of these um, locations to have this type of signage? Yes, uh, Trustee Holbrook, that that is the intent. This is I I would refer to this project here as a pilot to test the technology to see how feasible it is. The locations that we've selected um, were intentional because of the access to power and data. Um, if we want to move out into the system and start thinking about um, this technology and other locations. Um, We'll have to explore other um, ways to get the data to those locations. But um, yeah, we, our intention is that if this is successful, it had become, um, it had set a precedent for other locations. Thank you. Any final questions? Okay. Seeing none, I would entertain a motion on this contract. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the contract for the bus real-time digital signage equipment with Dactronics. I'll second that. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff, uh, to approve the contract as described. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Thanks, uh, GJ. Thank you, trustees. Uh, <clears throat> well, next move to a contract for the IDN uh, radio system repair and maintenance with uh, DC Tech uh, Inc. And with that, we welcome Dan Harmeth and Kyle Brimley. Good morning, Chairman and trustees. Uh, thank you very much for hearing us. Uh, as mentioned, I have Kyle Brimley with me. He is the manager over the information technology bus and rail communications, uh, which includes the IDEN uh, radio system that all the bus operators maintenance away and service employees use. Um, as Kyle manages and oversees this uh, UTA radio system, he's going to brief you on this contract request. Okay, Kyle. Thank you, trustees. Uh, as, as noted, uh, this is a contract for support uh, for the IDAN radio system that we have in place. Uh, we, the recommendation is to approve and authorize the executive director to execute and repair the maintenance contracts and associated disbursements for the, the maintaining the UTA system with DC Tech for a total of not to exceed $832,660. Uh, we bought this system in about 10 years ago, so it's a 10 year old system. Uh, it needs to have its support. We have gone out and looked at other systems for replacement. Uh, we plan on starting that replacement in 2023 through 2025, working with uh, uh, our sister company over there, or Utah Communications Authority, and start uh, writing on their network. Uh, we... Um, We earlier uh, last month, uh, we did a sole source for the company of DC Tech to take over the support contract and uh, provide the support and maintenance that we need in case of a catastrophe if we have on this network. And this is for a uh, two year contract with three, op three years to have options to uh, renew. Therefore, if we get our new radio system installed earlier, we can actually cancel uh, one of these options in the future. Uh, do you have any questions? Well, my understanding is uh, in part because of the age of the system, you don't have a lot of options about who you can procure to service it. Is that a fair statement? That is a very fair statement is we went out and looked at a lot of options and we had basically found one of the only providers of this type of service. Uh, Motorola sold off this service to, when they got uh, split up some of their services with Nokia and the IDEN system went with Nokia and Nokia stopped the support. So 
At the time, they, they stopped the support at 2017. We've worked with Motorola up until 2020, and now we're working with the third party provider directly that Motorola was using, which uh, it did save us about $30,000, $40,000 a year when we you know, negotiated through the sole source um, contract or yeah. agreement. Thank you. Other, any other questions uh, for Kyle or Dan? Kyle or Dan, both of you, I'm because um, if this contract has a no no penalty cancellation and goes through 2025, if I was reading that correctly, um, are we concerned that there could be another potential? And um, are we prepared if there is some challenge to this um, in terms of this um, ability long term? What, what would that look like? No, uh, it's a two year contract with options to renew on the third, fourth and fifth year. So we're planning on to start our installations in 2023, which would be about the third year. And we will renew uh, if we need this contract uh, as we migrate to the new system. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Seeing no other questions, I would entertain a motion on this particular contract. Chair, I'll make that motion. The contract with IDEN Radio System Repair and Maintenance, DC Tech Inc. to approve. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth, uh, for approval of the contract as stated. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Uh, thanks, uh, Kyle. Thanks. And we're, Thank again, it looks like you can't go away yet. Uh, this next item up is a contract with Panasonic Toughbook uh, Android tablet purchase with Mobile Concepts Technology LLC. Dan? Okay, thank you, Chairman and Trustees. Sean Stevens is with me. I think he may be coming online. Uh, he is the program manager overseeing and planning uh, the transit management system project and program, which includes uh, the CAD AVL system rewrite, the mobile data device software rewrite that's on all the buses and the rails and all the hardware replacements. So this request today is to authorize the purchase of 220 Panasonic Toughbook Android tablets in the amount of $419,980. The funds for this purchase uh, are coming out of the 2021 CapEx approved TMS project in ICI 217. Uh, this uh, project is a three year project funded at $5 million. Um, so the mobile data device software that uh operates on these tablets was developed and tested in uh nine or ten tracks cars of uh, the past few months uh with with these panasonic uh, tablets and everything is working well and now we want to uh, equip all the tracks cars all the 110 tracks cars so that's why we're requesting to purchase the 220 there's a tablet on each side of the tracks car because they go in different directions and, and uh, depending on which direction they're going to, the tracks operator will go to that side of the tracks car. Um, and so these are, are ready to be outfitted on the tracks fleet now that everything has been tested and the proof of concept has been positive for the past couple months. Uh, there's some future requests on the horizon. I just wanna let you know uh, for the bus fleet. So we've been testing now uh, the uh, new software for the buses. On, on a single bus right now, we're going to expand that a little bit. Uh, so we'll be coming to you in the future uh, months or later this year to request purchasing these Panasonic uh, tablets for the bus fleets as well. Um, just a side note, Many sectors out there are seeing computer chip shor uh, shortages in the supply chain. I'm sure you've probably read about this uh, due to the COVID-19. Uh, lead times for equipment shipping is getting longer. 
So uh, UTA should get our order submitted earliest uh, based on our budgets so that we can get into the uh, um, supply chain uh, process. So um, subject to your questions, Sean and I recommend approval of this purchase request and we'd be glad to answer any questions that you have. Dan, did this particular product, did you pick it based on its performance or is it a cost thing or is it a cost slash performance? Uh, what, what, and because obviously you'll be making a long-term commitment probably to the product. We did. Uh, the current uh, uh, mobile data computers that are in our buses uh, are actually several thousand dollars more than these Panasonic uh, uh, health book tablets. And so we looked at a combination of things. One is the durability of the tablet and not just putting in just Android tablets, but these are Toughbook and uh, these are used um, in law enforcement vehicles and other first responding vehicles. Uh, and so we tested them out. We looked at various different criteria. We brought in uh, representatives from uh, the bus operations, the supervisors, uh, the rail operations. We showed them several different types of products. Um, and uh, everybody coalesced on the Panasonic uh, Android tablet. And we look at this as a long-term uh, relationship with Panasonic. When Panasonic uh, uh, designs and develops uh, this equipment, they do it for the long-term in working with uh, law enforcement, first responding uh, organizations, DOD, and the transit community. So we feel very comfortable that uh, we're going to have good support and that this equipment is going to be durable for, you know, the cold, the heat, and the elements uh, that we have in our vehicles. Great. Does that answer your question? I'm sure Sean can talk a little bit more on no, that. No, that, that, that hit the nail right on the head. So thank you. It's very helpful. Other questions? Let's see. Not seeing any. Um, I would entertain a motion on this particular contract. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the contract with the Panasonic Toughbook Android tablet purchase for with Mobile Concepts Technology LLC. I'll second that. A motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff, to approve the contract as stated. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you, Dan and company. Appreciate Thank you. your efforts here. Um, next up is a contract on the front runner forward program management services with Kimley Horn. And we welcome back Mary Delaretto and uh, Janelle Robertson. Mary. Good morning again. Yes, this is to approve the award and authorize the executive director to execute a three-year contract, fixed price contract with a not to exceed value with Kinley Horn for the front runner forward program management services. For the first year, the contract amount is $4,835,137. This was a competitive procurement, was issued earlier this year. Kinley Horn was selected and it is a three-year contract. Each year we'll come back and negotiate the price and there are two one-year options available. I'm gonna turn it over to Janelle Robertson to give a little more details on the services that Kim Lee Horn is gonna provide with this contract. Yeah, so as you guys know, um, program managers essentially act as an extension of UTA staff to help us uh, deliver um, big projects and um, we have scoped uh, for this year for Kimberly Horn to get started um, on a business plan for the Front Runner Forward program um, that will help us um, determine what our actions should be on the program short term and long term um, to uh, improve the Front Runner service. And um, they would also be helping us um, with conceptual design, um, procuring environmental, um, on areas of double tracking that are determined to be the priority for improving the service. And so they're going to jump right in um, right away to help us kind of, those will be their main two tasks 
um, to get started for this year. And then as Mary mentioned, each year we will make an estimation of the staffing we'll need to continue the program and come back to you with what those, um, what that uh, contract will be for each of those additional years. Questions? I, I was going to say, Janelle, your your little uh, banner there is just making a pitch to Beth. Uh, <laughs> uh, psychologically, maybe so offending Jeff. I uh, potentially so. It really but. was a lovely bright spot in the morning. Thank you, Janelle. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and, I, and I have to, I have to say, Mary's wearing blue and white, so I don't yeah. know what that means. So we'll leave it, we'll leave it it's, there. It's a universal <laughs> pitch. Um, I, I uh, knowing that it's competitively bid, uh, what uh, aspects do you feel like uh, Kim Lee Horn brings to this discussion and in, in this role? Um, are there just so they you know, had a couple points? Yeah, so they had um, good experience with um, commuter rail um, business plans. Their proposed project manager has done one previously. Um, I think uh, Carolyn has had direct experience with them um, in that regard, too, if she wants to. I noticed that she turned on her camera. I don't know if she wants to add to that. Um, but uh, yeah, so they, they had good um, relevant experience in the program. Um, some of their subcontractors also have really good um, program management experience. They have WSP as a subcontractor who's been our program manager and for our previous front runner um, build. So they have a lot of um, great staff with good experience in, in this regard to this. Great, great. Carolyn, anything you wanted to add to that or? Yeah, I think Janelle did a good uh, good job um, defining sort of their their attributes and, and I do think you know there's two pieces primarily of this of the scope of this contract. One is to actually develop a business plan, and um, the project manager had been very involved in the Caltrain business plan. Similar, looking at how that um, system will grow, and I think they can bring that experience here in terms of the stakeholder and the engagement that needed to be done, as well as working within with with um, you know the employees of the agency and others to actually develop a plan that is implementable. Um, and a vision. Uh, the second is is that actually being able to design um, and, and manage the designers that are doing through some of the conceptual design, reviewing the cost estimates. They're very knowledgeable about the commuter rail system, about front runner um, specifically. So I think we have um, both with WSP and Horrocks um, very um, experienced employees and working on front runners. So I think this is is going to be able to be a good process combined with the previous. Um, the other contract on the um, operational analysis. So that will actually help us lay the groundwork for this next five to 10 years and be able to get contract packages out the door um, for us to be able to construct um, and move this project forward. Uh, I'm, I don't know, Mary, do you have anything else to add? I just also wanted to mention that the project manager um, with the consultant team is a former UTA employee and she did a great job for us, Liz Scanlon, and we're happy to have her back working with us at UTA. Great. Well, it sounds like you've made a great recommendation here. So uh, any other questions though from the board? I mean, uh, I would entertain a motion on this particular contract. Chair, I'll make that motion uh, for the contract for the front runner forward program management services with Kim Lee Horn. Second. I have a motion from Jeff that's uh, been seconded by Beth. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Thank you, um, uh, Janelle, and thanks, Mary. And uh, Mary, don't go away. It looks like we have a change order up next for Point of the Mountain Transit Design and Environmental Services with Parametrics Consultant, uh, Inc. And it uh, looks like Patty Garber may also join you. Yes, Pat, Patty is the project manager for that project, so I'm going to turn it over to her in a minute. But this is for changeover with Parametrics Consulting. They are the other contract right now and have been doing the transit study for this project. And now that we've identified a locally preferred alternative, we're ready to move on to the next phase of environmental services. So this change order is in the amount of $3,462,678. To complete that, that effort or, and the contract 
has been extended through June of 2023. And I'm going to turn it over to Patty to give a little more detail on what we expect from parametrics in this, this next phase of work. So Patty. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, trustees, for having me here. I'm so happy to be presenting this change order to you. So in the original RFP and contract for the transit study, we had the option of extending to the environmental for the consultant parametrics, as Mary mentioned. And the initial work will be to refine the preferred align alternative because our original southern terminus was at the Traverse Mountain Station and now we will be extending to the South Triumph Boulevard Station and then also west over I-15 to the Front Runner Lehigh Station. And similarly at the point, we are working closely with their planning consultant on the design across the point development. So that will be some refinements that parametrics will work, be working on. And then they will do design necessary to complete the environmental document and also the environmental document. And some other refinements will include, we'll have several elevated structures such as uh, to get across Bangor Highway and also to get across I-15 near 146 South and the other crossing down at Triumph Boulevard. So that is a summary of the work that they will be doing in this for this change order. Any questions? Mary, or Patty, is the sort of a little bit of expanded scope um, from earlier conversations, is that hoped or anticipated it would still be in the general budget range that we identified for the BRT or is that likely to grow a little bit? You mean the extensions that I talked about? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's actually included. That's some of the refinements that they'll be working on as part of the change order. Okay. Okay. That was think, in the transit study. Our initial uh, terminus was not as far south as we're looking at now. Yeah. I mean, the expansion makes a lot of sense based on a lot of the conversations and Jeff certainly would know more than I, but. Yeah, but, and also the way that it'll work together with the central corridor project. Yeah. Any questions on this contract? Patty, just a quick question. Thanks for thanks for your presentation on that. Um, how is this going to get us through the entire environmental process? Um, well, we we could use, we might need, so this will get us to conceptual engineering. If we need additional design, then it could, I would probably be coming back to you with an amendment for additional design. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm encouraged by somewhat of the expansion that uh, takes into account how the point of the mountain is going to fit into the central corridor. And I, I think that's a very welcome addition, not an over addition, because I know in Utah County, they would like to have seen it go even more, but I, I think this is a good step forward. And, and I think it will help tie in the systems once they both come along. So thank you for that. And I can, is it my turn to make a motion? Sure. Technically okay. mine, but I'll let you slide. Right, go ahead, Beth. No, I don't want to take that from you. It's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Je Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we approve the change order for the point of the mountain transit design and environmental services with Parametrics Consulting, Inc. And I'm excited to second that motion. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff. And now apparently there's some order to most making motions that I wasn't aware of. So, uh, but with that, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion motion passes. Thanks, Teddy. Uh, for Thank your you. Work Sarah, on the prior stuff. Yes, please, Mary. That Patty had presented the LPA to the board um, a couple months back, and 
at the June 2nd local advisory council meeting next week, she is going to be presenting the point of the mountain local as a fertile alternative to the advisory council. Just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. Okay. Thank you. And I understand, I oh, understand it's gone to some city councils, right? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, Lehigh City just adopted it uh, through the LPA through resolution last night. And it's going to Draper next week for a resolution also. That's what I'd heard. That's great. What, what yeah. great progress. So. The board meeting on here. It's kind of interesting okay. how they manage that. Okay. Let's see. I don't know who that was, but <laughs> anyway. Um, all right. I think that's it, Patty. Uh, Mary, anything okay. else on that one? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We're going to uh, move forward um, through the fares uh, item, and then we'll probably take a break before we get into the discussion items. But on service and fare approvals, the first item up is a fare contract for Ed Pess, uh agreement modification number one with Mountainland Technical College, and we welcome Kinsey Kunkel. Kinsey, good morning. Good morning, trustees. Thank you for your time this morning to present. Uh, I'll be presenting three different fares contracts for your approval. So the first two contracts that I will present for your approval are education pass agreements. And I'll start with the contract modification to Mountainland Technical College. UTA and Mountainland Technical College, um, I'll refer to them as MTEC, are in the third year of their three-year ed pass agreement. And through this contract, MTech provides premium transit passes to all students, faculty, and staff that attend their institutions. So this contract is set to expire July 31st of this year. Um, as both UTA and MTech recover from the pandemic and in the spirit of partnership, it is recommended that the MTech contract be extended for one additional year through July 31st, 2022 and the pricing and authorized users will remain the same as the current contract or $19,000 and $4,500 authorized users. So if you don't have any additional questions, I would like to ask for your approval to modification number one of the Mountainland Technical College Ed Pass Agreement. Any questions on this item? Being none, I would entertain a motion. Uh, Chair, I'll make that motion for the fair contract. Uh, Ed Pass Agreement Modification Number One with Mountain Land Technology College. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, uh, um, seconded by Beth. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Okay. Item B, Kenzie. All right. So up next is Enzyme College, which is formerly LDS Business College. And they are also in their third year of their three-year um, Ed Pass agreement, where 3,300 of their students, faculty, and staff receive a premium transit pass. And this contract is also set to expire on July 31st, 2021. So it is recommended that the Enzyme College Ed Pass contract be extended one additional year through July 31st, 2022 and all terms of the contract will remain the same, including the contract price of $67,000. So if you don't have any additional questions on this, I would like to ask for your approval to modification number one of the Enzyme College Ed Pass Agreement. Maybe, uh, Jano, could we rotate up one slide? I want to make sure we're on the right slide. Uh, the only question I had, Kinsey, I was surprised that 3,300 was all that they used. Is that is that seemed to be, I guess, in line? It just seems like they have more students than that. Maybe they just don't use our system yet. Yeah, so that is the number that they have provided to us. We do ask for their authorized user count um, 100%. Okay. Great. Uh, any questions on this one? Mm -hmm. Okay. Seeing none, I would uh, entertain a motion on this contract for, for modification. Mr. Chair, I'd make a motion that we approve the fair contract uh, Ed Pass Agreement Modification Number One with Mountainland Technical College. Is that? 
Did, I'm sorry. Could you not hear me? I apologize. No, no, I can hear you. Oh, okay. I, I can't hear Jeff, so. Jeff. That's right. There we go. What did, did you happen to second that, Jeff? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay. So I have a motion. Order, motion for, um, yes, Jenna. And um, that should be for Ensign College and not Mount Man Technical College. Oh, sorry. Sorry, thank you for catching that, Jenna. Thank you for catching that. I apologize. I was on the wrong. Um, I'll, I'll modify, I'll remake my motion to approve the fair contract ed pass agreement modification number one with Ensign College. I will second that. I have a motion from Beth, uh, seconded by Jeff, to uh, the um, ed pass agreement modification. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that uh, motion passes. We'll go then to item C, uh, Kenzie. All right. So last but not least, we have the Hive Pass um, contract. So the Hive Pass gives Salt Lake City residents access to a discounted monthly transit pass. The price is $68 per month, which is a 20% discount. Of that $68, Salt Lake City pays 26, making the price of the pass to the residents only $42. As a reminder, the board previously approved Amendment 1, which adjusted the price of the high pass to align with the fair change last December. The current agreement expires on June 30th, but this agreement extends it for one additional year through June 30th, 2022. Revenue is estimated to be between $408,000 to $510,000 and is based on sales for contract year 2020-21. So following your questions, I'd like to ask for your approval of amendment number two to the high class purchase and administration agreement with Salt Lake City Corporation. Oh, the only question I had, Kenzie, is, you know, as we look at other pass options, um, including the low income, is, is there a thought that at some point um, Salt Lake City would be more interested in going down a different literally path or or do you, or they seem fairly happy with the Hive program? We're always in discussion about ways to improve and better contracts. Um, so right now this is what we have identified as working for them and their needs right now. Yeah, okay. Other questions? Or Okay. Seeing none, I would entertain a motion on this um, uh, Chair, amendment. Chair, I'm ready to make a motion on the fair contract with high pass purchase and administration agreement amendment number two with Salt Lake City Corporation. Second. I have a motion from Jeff, seconded by Beth. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion passes. Kenzie, thank you. Um, we're going to let's take a 10 minute uh, break and we'll return at 1040 for our discussion items and the rest of our agenda.
We've returned from our uh, break uh, for our, our board meeting today. Um, during the first part of our meeting, it has come to our attention that one of the sister agencies of us uh, there in California, VTA, has had some tragic uh, shooting uh, in their rail yard area of um, some employees. And, and uh, while uh, information is still forthcoming, our hearts definitely go out to our transit family and, and that agency in particular and for any loss of life and injury that has taken place. And certainly a reminder uh, to us um, of, of, um, of the harshness of these kinds of circumstances. And so our thoughts and prayers are with them and uh, we certainly uh, um, are to the families that have been affected. So. With that, we uh, will return to our discussion items and uh, first item up, and we appreciate their uh, uh, willingness to let us kind of um, move them to this week. We ran out of time last week and first item up is the Depot District Clean Fuels Technology Center update. And with that, we welcome uh, David Osborne. Dave, welcome. Thanks, Chair and Trustees. Uh, glad to be here and have an opportunity to provide a, an update on this project. And so um, this first uh, slide here just shows a rendering of what the front of the administration building will, will look like. Um, but we're right now we're working on that initial phase uh, of the project uh, that will get us up to 150 bus capacity. And then there's uh, opportunity to expand uh, by uh, increasing parking and other things to get up to a 250 bus capacity with the facility. So can we go to the next slide, please? So just a, a quick review of uh, some of the phases that are already completed, and then we'll get into the current and future phases for the project. But the first phase was uh, demolishing the old, uh, some of the old buildings that were there on the site uh, to make way for the new buildings. And that's been completed now for a while. Next slide, please. And then this phase is, was the, the second phase and it was our uh, new wash building, uh, the fueling island uh, and the west parking lot in addition to uh, kind of closing up where we had demolished the old building that was connected to FLHQ. Um, and that's, uh, we're just finishing uh, this work up. The parking lot and the wash building have been completed for, for a few months now. Um, and we are just doing the last few things on the, the fueling island right now. Uh, we needed to, to coordinate with uh, the emergency stops for the natural gas as well as the diesel to make those work together. It was something that the uh, city required. And so we're working on uh, getting that done right now. And then that should be completed here in the next couple of months. So can we go to the next slide? And these are just some some photos that we have of that. This is the, the fueling island. Um, there on the one side, you can see our uh, above ground tanks. And then on the other side is a picture of the driveway where we can uh, fuel uh, white fleet vehicles. And then uh, this would also be where the tanker trucks would deliver fuel to fill those large above ground tanks. Uh, next slide, please. This is the, uh, the new parking lot. And that's been completed for a while and you can see we've got the landscapings in um, everything on that should be ready to go. We have just a maybe a couple of small uh, punch list items that the contractor is still working through, but we've been using a lot now for for a few months. Next slide, please. This is a, a picture of the bus wash building, uh, both on the exterior, as you can see, it's right there just underneath the fourth south viaduct. And then on the other side is a picture of the inside of the wash bay where you can see the equipment and other things. And uh, this has also been completed for a few months and we've actually been been using it. Um, uh, we just had the manufacturer of the equipment out last week to make a couple of tweaks uh, based on some things that we'd noticed as we'd been using it. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, phase three is the phase that we're uh, under construction on right now. And it's uh, the construction of the new maintenance and administration building, as well as the site work immediately around it. So you can see here in this map, it, that would include uh, the 
parking area where the buses will park, the building, as well as a storm water pond uh, there on that small triangular piece that you can see highlighted. Uh, next slide, please. These are just a couple of pictures of some of the ongoing construction. Uh, you can see on the one side there, there's lots and lots of buried conduit, uh, lots of electrical and other things that will be going on in the new building. Uh, so lots of things to coordinate and to work through. Uh, on the other side, this was a, a test lab of a option for the flooring within the building, uh, just that gave it kind of a, a brighter, wider uh, finish, so it would make the inside of the building lighter, and, and so uh, that was a test slab of that. Um, next slide. The big thing that's happening right now is the, the tilt-up panels for the new building, and I have a few pictures here that kind of show how that process progresses and a little bit about how it works. And so there in the upper left hand, you'll see uh, where the contractors come in and they pour a temporary concrete slab uh, that acts as a form on the ground. And then on the right side, you'll see where there's forms. And so what they'll do is they put wood forms on there and then they pour in a layer of concrete that'll be the actual face of the building. And then that uh, the pink material that's there is insulation. And so there's a layer of concrete and then insulation. You can see the little spots on there. That's how the uh, insulation attaches to the concrete. And they do all of that with that first pour of concrete. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Hey, Dave, the, are they, oh, are yeah, they able to continue to use that OSB over and over again or, or the forms? I'm, the forms they do and so they've actually used those multiple times on the project they kind of move them around so just with the price of lumber i thought boy that would be an expensive proposition yeah for sure and so um so then you here on the the left side they've got the um this is the next step in it they come in and they put reinforcing steel in there and then another layer of of concrete that goes on there to the top of the forms um, and then when that's done, they take the forms off and you can see over on the right side, that's kind of those finished panels um, and what they, they look like they're laying on the ground. Go to the next slide, please. And then this, these are some photos. They've actually start, they started um, last week and that work will be continuing this week and probably for a portion, at least a portion of next week to tilt those panels up. And so this, uh, the picture on the left was taken out of one of the uh, windows here at FLHQ. You can see the crane holding the panel up. So they lift them up off the ground and they take them over and position them in place and then temporarily support them. You can see another photo there on the, on the right uh, of a wall that they've been working on that's mostly stuff. I mean, you can see those temporary supports as well as the crane. Can we go to the next slide, please? So on the, the maintenance building, uh, kind of that ongoing work that's happening right now is they're, you know, they're continuing to, they're getting, I think, close on most of the foundation work. They've been working on the admin portion of the building for that. And then also the tilt panel work. Um, uh, that tilt panel work started mid-May and it's, it's ongoing. Some of the challenges that we've had recently, and I heard this was even mentioned in one of the earlier presentations, but there's been some struggles with materials. Uh, there's been some shortages with some of the ingredients that go into the concrete. And so that's, uh, there's been some challenges to work through on that. Um, and then some of the other items that they've been dealing with, uh, steel lead time has increased quite a bit. And we're fortunate most of the steel for this phase of the project has been procured already. There's a lot of it that's on site already. If you look out onto the site, you'll see a, a lot of materials stockpiled and stored here. Uh, but we do still, we will still need to procure steel for our bus canopies. And so that's a little bit of a concern. At the last meeting, we presented the, the contract to do the final design for those canopies. And so we're uh, working to get those designed here this summer and get that design to our contractor for pricing so we can do a contract and get that steel ordered as well. But those are some challenges that we're working through and dealing with. As a matter of fact, just earlier this week at our meeting, the contractor mentioned that uh, there are metal studs and sheetrock for the inside of the building. 
they were notified that even though they ordered it months ago, that they're going to get that material several weeks late. And so that is a big challenge right now on, I'm sure on all of our projects, but we're noticing it on this one as well. Uh, next slide, please. So this is some of the, the these is a description of the future uh, phases that are there. And that's our bus canopy, our electric uh, battery electric bus charging, um, as well as possible solar component. And so our anticipated construction on that would be next year. Um, and, and like I said, last last meeting, we were here to get uh, to get contract approval so that we could do the final design on the bus canopies and the electric bus charging. So that's ongoing right now. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so as I mentioned on the bus charging and the canopies, we're looking to do contractor pricing this summer. Um, initially, we sh will be able to charge up to, to 30 buses. Um, uh, but we're going to put in uh, vaults, conduits, other things, so that we could expand that up to 78 buses. So we'll have uh, four canopies here in this phase, and we'd uh, be able to start charging at one canopy, would have all the equipment, and then we'd be able to expand to a, a second canopy with those uh, conduits and vaults and other underground infrastructure by adding the equipment and the wiring uh, at a later date. Um, another thing that we're working through is we've had uh, Rocky Mountain Power involved for the last year, helping us out doing a study to look at our power needs for the site. Um, and in particular, the bus charging, there's quite a power requirement uh, to do that battery electric bus charging. And so we've been looking at that and how many buses we'd have now, plus maybe future opportunities and how that would work. And we will need to do... Uh, uh, put in some conduits and other things um, along Second South and onto our uh, property for Rocky Mountain Power to for them to be able to uh, bring and deliver that power that's necessary. And so we've got our design team uh, working on a design for that. And that'd be our, our portion of that would be to help with that underground infrastructure that Rocky Mountain Power needs in order to pull their conductors and put their equipment in. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a kind of a status of the, of the phases of the project. So phase one is completed. That was our building demolition and abatement. Uh, phase two is, is nearly complete. Um, we've got, like I said, just a couple of things left on the, the fueling island area and just a couple of punch list items left for the parking lot and the wash building. And so that was roughly $9.1 million for, for construction. And then phase three, we have that construction is underway. That's the, the building and the bus parking, uh, just over $51 million for that. Uh, currently, we, we have had some change orders, but we're currently within our contingency that we have within the, within the project for those, those items. We go to the next slide, please. So we got these, these future phases um, that'll happen. And so we've got our canopies. Our estimated cost on those right now is about seven and a half million dollars. As I mentioned, we are a little bit concerned with what's been happening with steel and some of the other building materials prices. It seems like there's cost increase. We're hearing of cost increases weekly, if not daily, uh, in particular on steel with the availability and other things. Um, we have our electric bus charging. Our estimated cost on that's approximately 3.7 million. And then we have uh, in the budget, we had uh, $4 million earmarked for a possible solar component on the project. Our other costs uh, that we have on the projects would would be for, you know, the design work, uh, materials testing, construction observation, uh, some utility relocations or project management or contingency. We've got to put by furniture for the building. Um, and so our overall total total project is $95 million. I believe that is the last slide that we had. And so I guess I would ask if there's any questions or anything that anyone would like to ask. David, you may have mentioned it, so I apologize. Um, uh, I can't remember in our last sort of uh, budget approval or our approval on this project, does it include the future phases aspect or will you need to come back to us at that point? Uh, are you are you are you mentioning for the like the canopies and the bus yeah. charging and, and that for yeah. the construction? We'll need to come back for that later this summer as we okay. get the design finished and as we get um, 
uh, bids from our contractor, we'll need to come back for an approval for that. Okay, that's kind of what I'd remembered, but I couldn't remember for sure. So, um, qu questions? It's exciting to see it moving forward, by the way. Um, questions, uh, Beth? Do you Oh, thank you. I had a question, David. Um, yeah. Some of the um, elements of, of all of this uh, delays and, and, and shortages and challenges obtaining materials. Um, it's, I, I know this is an ambiguous question, but is there any more of a, what I would consider to be a long range estimate that some of this will equal itself out once some of these earlier supply chain issues have been resolved? Or when you look long term, are we just consistently seeing unpredictability and cost increases on all of these materials. I think there is some un, there is some unpredictability and some cost increases. Our contractors have been working hard to try and mitigate that to the extent that they can. Um, you know, by you know, with the concrete kind of trying to rearrange their schedule a little bit. It, obviously, it's difficult. We're building a concrete building. So that does get hard. And I know there's been times where they've wanted to, you know, been ready and wanted to do pours and have been unable to because they couldn't get uh, concrete. I think right now our biggest risk items on the cost is the is the can is this next phase that we're going to do pricing on, which would be the canopies and the electric bus charging. Um, as far as you know, uh, potential cost stuff. Um, and like I said, on on a lot of the with the steel and other things for the current phase that we're working on for the building, a lot of that material's already been ordered. And so the prices have been locked in on that. Um, and so I think it's really, it's those, those future items where we have some, where we have some risk and we'll know later this summer on that. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or not. It was, it's a hard, it's hard. It's more of just a commentary, I guess, because um, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm just, when we look at some of these elements, it's, um, you know, and this is obviously anecdotal, but you hear that there's a, workers are not coming back as quickly. There's other elements to that. And I'm just wondering if that's, um, if if the person who's your contractor is looking at those elements or other things. But anyway, it's just a general commentary. And, and you did answer it because I know it is, it's, it's difficult to articulate really. So yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> they are well aware of all the challenges because they, and they do a good job of notifying us, you know, as soon as the concrete thing happened, I mean, they got with us and said, Hey, this is going to be a challenge for us. We know it. And we we're, we're doing the best that we can and we're trying to, you know, rearrange things. And, but yeah, there is, there is definitely a little bit of risk on, on completion date um, and some cost as well. Thank you. Any other questions for Dave? Dave, thanks for that update and uh, thanks for your work on the project. It, it's exciting to see it uh, continue to move forward. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, our next discussion item up uh, for us is our 2020-2021 ski service report. And um, with that, we welcome our um, Chief Operating Officer, Eddie Cummins. Uh, Eddie, good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is a short report on our most recent ski season. Uh, I have Andreas Coleman, Lauren Simpson, and Mary Delamar Schieffer with me today to answer any questions you may have. Um, so overall, this first slide talks about, oh, you can go to the next slide. There we go. Thank you. Um, overall, the, this first slide shows, uh, you know, our overall system, system-wide. Uh, we have seven routes total. Uh, we serve seven resorts, and we operate 60 ski buses. It's important to note that uh, the, the 60 ski buses includes, and the board may remember at the beginning of the year, beginning of the season, we had some concerns about uh, uh, managing our loads with ski riders. And so we kept seven, seven of our old uh, 2007 ski buses that were set to be retired. So we have 53 active buses and we kept those seven just in case we needed them. Um, and obviously, our uh, our ridership was impacted uh, by the COVID pand uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. Overall, our ridership was down approximately thirty two percent. In the next slides, we will talk about uh, each of the business units and how they perform. Next slide, please. Uh, starting up north um, at our Mount Ogden business unit, the Mount Ogden business unit operates three routes. They have the Route 664 that operates from Ogden to Powder Mountain, 
the Route 675 goes from Ogden to Snow Basin, and the Route 667 um, runs from Layton to Snow Basin. And Mount Ogden Business Unit operates uh, 12 ski buses. Uh, this was the uh, service unit that was hit the hardest in regards to ridership. The Route 674 was down 59% when we compare that to the 2019-2020 ski season. Route 675 was down 56%. Route 677 was down 31%. Overall total ridership Mount Ogden service unit uh, was down 53%. Next slide, please. This next slide is our Salt Lake service unit. Uh, Salt Lake operates three routes. They have the Route 953 that operates from Midvale, Fort Union to Snowbird and Alta. We have the Route uh, 972 that operates from Bingham Junction to Solitude and Brighton and 994 that runs from historic Sandy Station to uh, Snowbird and Alta. Uh, Salt Lake Service Unit operates 38 ski buses. Um, their ridership this year wasn't impacted quite as much as that of Mount Ogden's. Uh, Route 953 was down 28%, 972 was down 32%, 994 was down 22%, and overall ridership was down uh, about 28%. Next slide, please. And last but not least, our Timpanoga service unit operates uh, one route. That's the Route 880 that runs from Orem to Sundance. And they have three ski buses that uh, provide this service. And similar to the Salt Lake service unit, the Route 880 was down uh, just a little over 26%. Next slide, please. So although ridership was not as strong as, uh, as, as it has been in the past, it did help us with managing some of those uh, heavy loads that we've seen in recent years. And so considering the circumstances, I think we had a relatively good season. As the pandemic restrictions begin to lift, we are hopeful we'll see our ridership return next year. And with that, my team and I are, are uh, happy to answer any questions the board may have. Eddie, one question, and I don't know if, we know the answer to this, but it seemed like, and I'm not a skier, so I, I hope I don't sound uh, too awkward or out of place here, but it seemed like resorts sort of uh, required you to sort of pre-register. And so you probably didn't have the sort of high peak loads of skiers that you might in a normal season. Do we have any sense about how much they cut back versus our percentages and whether or not those correlate or, or do we just, think that people were a little more comfortable in their own cars under the circumstance? I think people were a little more comfortable in their cars, but I'd ask Lauren Simpson to speak to that. Uh, he's been pretty close to the service there in the canyons. Lauren? Yeah, I don't have specific data uh, for the ski resorts in, in the Cottonwood Canyons, but I know um, uh, Chairman Christensen, you're correct that they did have some uh, pre-registration requirements. They managed their parking um, really well that helped them manage their loads, but also some of that managing of their parking with, with signage at the mouth of the canyon and through some apps that they had to notify uh, skiers if the parking lot was full, that would push them to transit. So I think that is in part why uh, in the Cottonwood Canyons, the loss of riders was less than we saw on our typical routes in the valley because People still wanted to go skiing, and if the parking lot was full, they were notified that they couldn't park there until they would come to, to transit. So I think that helped. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Did we end up having to utilize those seven extra older buses, or, or were we um, able to manage our... I, I know we socially distanced some of those loads, and so I was just curious. We did. We ended up using a few of those buses from time to time, especially on, you know, those really heavy days, powder days. Uh, you know, it wasn't something that we had to do every single day, but we did have them out there. If you remember, the board was, you know, I think part of that discussion, but we limited loads to 20 passengers. And so there were times that we saw heavy loads and we we uh, implemented those extra surge buses. So they, they turned out to be very helpful for us. Do you think we're going to keep them just in case there's still some element of a social distancing? I mean, I don't know. It doesn't seem like there will be, but I am. You just never know, right? That's a great question. Uh, right now, we're planning to dispose of those assets. Um, but, you know, as, as we'll see how things change. You know, that's something that we can choose to do if we need to. 
Thanks, Eddie. Thank you. So, Chair, I, I do have a question, uh, and it's it's more, it's probably a broader question that you may not have an answer to, Eddie, and uh, and that is, I, I think this last snow season was not a bump, it wasn't a great year for snow. I don't know how it compares to the previous year. I assume it was, that year was better than this year, in my understanding. That probably affects a little bit of our ridership as well. To what degree, I don't know. And I don't know if you have a handle on that. You know, I'm hopeful this coming ski season, this next year, that that uh, we're going to be in for a real snowstorm uh, that will help. But I'm sure that affects overall ridership as well. But. Absolutely. I mean, last year we had a great uh, snow season, right? We had, we had a ton of snow. I think that this year is more similar to, I think it was 2015, uh, when we really didn't get a lot of snow that year. Um, so it definitely affects it. I mean, powder days draws a uh, crowd. And, um, you know, if there's a lack of snow, there's a lack of riders. But I think that this year, I think our ridership was more impacted by the pandemic than it was from the snow. Thank you. One question I have, and probably for Lauren, um, uh, I'm happy to take it from whoever might have the answer. Um, Lauren, the, um, in the Central Wasatch Commission in their deliberations and you know recommendations and ultimately that really the decision is you don't probably the Transportation Commission. But if they were to put some kind of revenue control and, and, and traffic management on the canyons in particular Little Cottonwood Canyon, um, that might push a lot of people toward transit. Uh, um, you know, depending on what that congestion pricing might look like. Uh, but it also might free up road space <laughs> and an ability for the bus to sort of move up and down the canyon a little. If that were to take place, do you think the current number of buses could, you know, given the opportunity to perform better, could handle those uh, without having to add a lot of new buses, at least initially? Or would that sort of send us reeling uh, with a lot of passengers that were not able to convey in a very timely way? I will let Lauren answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you, Lauren. <laughs> so you're absolutely right. It would uh, push more people to transit. That would be a good thing. It would make our buses more efficient on those heavy days if they don't have to compete with traffic. Uh, but clearly the impact, if the majority were pushed to transit, um, it would be too much for our system. We would need to add buses. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, I can't imagine anything taking place this year. And I, I you know, I'm, I've reminded of my time and time again that you just can't go and buy a bus off the lot and have it ready in a couple months. Um, and I think you don't understand that um, well. So I, but it will be interesting to see how, what, where the dialogue and discussion, you know, tra progresses towards. So uh, are there other questions? It looks like Becky might have had a. I do. I kind of, when you were talking about that um, and about that, uh, you know, the the, lot, the fact that you can't order a bus and get it relatively quickly. Um, and I know this might be outside of the scope, but do we do any like weather, do we work with anybody who does weather forecasting and modeling and, and predictability methods? Um, just curious if that's a, a facet of it. I mean, I know that we probably really haven't done that in the past or maybe we have, but it does seem like, you know, given these these cyclical drought cycles and and all of these other elements, I was just curious. During the ski season, we pay very close attention to uh, to the weather. And we're also always in talks with the resorts and hearing what they're thinking and what they're planning. You know, it's just kind of ongoing communication throughout the year. Um, you know, the system that we have today we're, are, is designed for the loads that we always anticipate. And I think we always kind of lean towards, you know, really good ski seasons. Um, but as Chair Christensen pointed out, you know, if they're, if we see those look increased, then obviously we would have to increase frequency and then we would look at needing additional resources without a doubt. Yeah. 
Hey, Eddie, Thanks. can I add something to that? That might you be bet. helpful. So um, we budget, we have a little bit of contingency budget for ski service that allows us to flex our service a bit. We have this, this scheduled service that's on the public schedule that we run every day, but we watch the weather and we see when there's going to be a big storm that, and we anticipate that and we know the loads are going to be really high. And we have a little bit of contingency where we can uh, throw a few extra buses up there to help with that. So I um, thought that might be helpful. That is helpful. I appreciate that. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, to your point, Carlton, uh, if uh, if you dot were to implement some kind of, uh, you know, to to force uh, force or at least create a, a higher demand for transit, I, I trust that we're in good coordination with you dot to make sure if their mindset is to moving that direction, they give us enough heads up that uh, we don't fall on our face. Uh, yeah, that 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 line of communication needs to really be connected. So, and I trust we're doing it. I just, when Carlson said that, I thought, oh my goodness, one little decision could really cause a major uh, uh, concern for UTA. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Trustee Aceson. Uh, I think, as the board knows, we have a great relationship with UDOT, and that's somebody that we're in constant communication with and working through future challenges. And I would just add, you know, through the these discussions I mentioned, the staff has really been outstanding in, in responding to inquiries. So the dialogue's been very much ongoing. So, all right. Yeah, I, I not seeing any other, uh, well, we'll hope for a little more snow next year uh, and uh, enough water to get us through this summer. So <laughs> thanks for that update. And considering the public health circumstances, your numbers look great, really, um, and and kudos to all of you for your efforts to make that happen. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Um, let's uh, next move to our customer benchmark survey uh, for 2020. Uh, this says B, so I'm assuming this like as a second phase or something of that nature, or or it's a typo, one one way or the other. Uh, Andrea Packer, and I know you're joined by R and R partners as well as the Cicero Group. Andrea, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, we are excited to present uh, the benchmark survey results to you today. Um, we are joined by a couple of members of our team from R and R. Cicero is is not with us today, but I'll just uh, let uh, uh, Jen and then Mandy just take a few quick seconds um, and introduce themselves before we begin. So, Jen. Thanks, Andrea. Um, it's nice to be here with everyone today. I'm Jen Riley, um, the account lead from r, r Partners, and we work in collaboration with Andrea and her marketing communications team on the research um, as well as strategy and campaign development and execution. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having us today. My name is Mandy Walsh. Mm -hmm. I'm the primary research manager at r, &R Partners. Um, and I help facilitate the focus group and surveys that we'll be reviewing today. So thank you again. Uh, so thank you, uh, Jen and Mandy, and uh, thank you, Chair and Trustees. Um, as I said, we're really excited to present this today. Um, the 2020 B is, is not a typo, uh, uh, Chair Christensen. Um, we do the survey every year, I think, I think you're aware. Um, in late 2019, we started it, but it carried over um, into 20, uh, 2020. And so we did present to you uh, last March on the last survey. Um, and so we refer to this as B just to keep uh, the different surveys kind of straight in our heads if they, if they overlap years. Um, so last fall, uh, late 2020, we started this effort. Um, and we'll get into the different phases um, that uh, included a quick poll survey report that was kind of unique to us this year. Um, next slide, please. Um, just for a little background, we've been doing this survey, um, we say, you know, 15 plus years. Um, I've been doing this survey since I came to UTA um, 19 years ago. Um, and it really is one of the few surveys um, at UTA that does include the general public in addition to our writers is we are looking for public sentiment in, in addition to writer sentiment. And kind of our process for using this survey is it's designed to help us 
in the advertised marketing and communications department uh, to kind of frame our strategy and messaging. So we typically start with focus groups and we'll give an overview of those. And then we do um, uh, the full uh, survey, uh, uh, telephone survey. Um, this year we had a little bit of a, of a mid-year effort that we'll talk about. And then that helps us frame our strategy message development, and then that feeds into all of our advertising and marketing campaigns throughout the year. So we really use it as a data tool um, to guide um, our efforts in, in our department. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to give you a sense of the overall objectives, um, we use this survey to first, as I mentioned, overall public perception of UTA as an organization. We also gauge perception of our different services, primarily bus, tracks, and front runner. Um, we question um, kind of some high level information about why people ride or don't ride or what, um, what they might be able to use it for, as well as asking what would be the best um, motivators or things that we could do to um, encourage them to ride. And then from a communications perspective, uh, we ask them where, we, where they will look for or receive their information about our products and services. Um, and then this year was very unique to us. Um, we threw in a few COVID questions as this survey was done in December. And um, just uh, kind of as a reminder as, as we go through the initial part of this survey, um, you know, this was almost six months ago when we were in still kind of the midst of the pandemic before vaccines came out and before there was really much talk of very many things opening like um, returning to work or events um, and, and some schools have started to tease it. So we'll talk about how we really used um, the survey and information about uh, people's response to COVID to help guide our efforts. Um, Next slide, please. Yeah, so we'll go into more detail in the next um, few slides, but wanted to mention a few key highlights. Um, and what Andrea said is, keep in mind, this was uh, done six months ago and heavily influenced by the pandemic. Um, and But we don't wanna lose sight of the positive momentum that we've gained in recent years. So we're tracking um, you know, much more than, than just the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and that impact. Um, but you know, what we did find was that many of our riders did stop waiting because there wasn't a need. <clears throat> Excuse me, offices had closed, in-person events were canceled, um, schools went largely um, remote and uh, businesses closed. So we wanted to know what UTA could do to make people uh, feel safer riding. Um, and similar to national data that we've been tracking, many said nothing would make them feel safer, um, while others cited many of the proactive safety measures that UTA had put in place uh, would make them feel more comfortable, such as mask wearing, regular cleaning and sanitizing, social distancing practices. Um, and that largely fueled our spring campaign where we focused on reassurance and safety, which we'll talk about in a few minutes here. Um, our pulse survey um, also indicated that the message did reach the intended audience and people reported seeing the message that uh, about UTA's efforts to keep riders safe. Um, and many agree um, that UTA is safe, reliable, um, as well as easy, or is easy, excuse me, um, and a benefit for students, the communities, and um, our environment. So I'll turn it back over to Andrea and Mandy to talk about the focus groups and survey in more detail. So next I think slide. We go to, to the next slide, yeah. Yep, and I think Jen already gave uh, those highlights about the Pulse survey and some already conclusions. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, starting with the focus groups, we did, um, we usually hold two focus groups before we kick off this first. Um, and we did do that. Those are typically one comprised of non-riders, and we classify those who have not used UTA service um, in, in more than two years, and then a group of riders. And we do try to um, uh, mix that up with how they uh, use the service, which modes they use, so we get a good balance of that, as well as how they pay. We try to get a mix of how people pay. Uh, so we have good a good blend of uh, the usage of the system in that group. Um, as Andrea, we mentioned, can yes. Can I ask one question? Sure. Uh, in addition to gender, did you look at uh, racial? Um, yes. Mix as well, I assume. 
Um, yes, yeah, so we look at we look at geography, we look at gender, um, we look at race, um, and I think uh, Manny may have the data, but um, we looked at those figures and um, and the balance that we had with um, with race and that equity is pretty representative of our market and the region that we surveyed. If I'm correct, Mandy. Yeah, we we make sure to recruit a good mix of um, both race and ethnicity. Great, thank you. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. No, please um, welcome your questions um, as we go along. So, um, uh, but then just quickly, we did a, a, a unique thing this year and did a third focus group that was specific to COVID. And we recruited people who have spent their use of UTA um, since the outbreak began so we could dive a little bit deeper into some of that information and data. Um, next slide, please. Wonderful. So um, yeah, I can go ahead and review some of those key themes that we heard coming out of our focus groups. Um, I won't really go into full detail or, or read these slides word for word. I know there's a lot here to digest. Um, so again, I'll just put on some of those high notes. And just a reminder, you know, this data is qualitative. Um, as Andrea mentioned, you know, we did speak to 17 people. Um, but this data is really useful because it helps us identify red flags, um, look for trends, and even uncover topics that we might want to include. Um, in the actual survey, like Andrea mentioned, we included some of those COVID-19 questions. Um, so starting here with our first group, our non-writers, you know, the themes are pretty consistent with past studies. Um, they tend to be pretty familiar with UTA overall, but their perceptions aren't always as positive as the current riders, which is completely understandable just given their, you know, more limited interaction with public transportation in general. But we do see, you know, again, just consistent with past studies that, especially with this group, convenience and access are really going to be key, especially when it comes to encouraging any type of ridership. Um, but, you know, as it was uh, briefly mentioned earlier, some of these um, people just generally don't have the need to ride. You know, they identify as homemakers, they're retired, they're working from home, and they're just not actively looking to ride or actively looking into public transportation at this time. Um, next slide, please. Wonderful. So moving on to our um, COVID-19 lapsed riders. And again, these, these were current riders, um, but they pretty much stopped just because of the pandemic. Um, and though they do tend to have pretty positive perceptions of UTA overall, again, many just simply stopped because they didn't have the need during 2020. Um, again, you know, school went virtual, events were canceled, more people were working from home. Um, but, you know, when we did talk to them, um, you know, when these groups were conducted in the fall of last year, Many did plan to increase their ridership once things started to open back up again. Um, so I would just assume, you know, if we were to talk to these individuals today in the present time, I'm, you know, pretty sure their perceptions and probably riding behavior would change just based on what they told us back in 2020. Um, next slide, please. Perfect. So looking at our last group, our current riders, again, just hitting on some of those key themes that we heard. Um, again, really no surprise here that, you know, because they do have the most familiarity with UTA, they also, you know, tend to have the most positive perceptions overall. Um, but many do talk to us about some areas of improvements they'd like to see. Um, they, you know, a lot of them mentioned just wanting more service in terms of, you know, more frequency, more coverage, and also just a desire for shorter wait times overall, which, you know, those two really do go hand in hand with one another. Um, but, you know, overall, for our current riders, the pandemic wasn't really a huge barrier to, to riding public transportation. Um, even though we did hear from a few people that they were a bit uncomfortable and felt it was kind of risky to be around others at that time, you know, they still continued to ride and they still just continued to build that trust in UTA throughout 2020. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back to Andrea. Thank you, Manny. Next slide, please. Okay, so getting in, so once we finished the focus groups, we did go um, in December and conducted the telephone and online survey. Um, uh, again, we oversampled and, and got at least 600 surveys. We like to do that to make sure we have good representation from all of the counties in our service area. Um, and again, we look very closely to get a good balance of uh, gender as well um, as employment status, education, and ethnicity. And as we previously mentioned, um, and looking at that data, um, uh, the recruiting and the, re and the results of the survey were very representative um, of, uh, of the region that we serve in our service area. Um, next slide, please. So this slide kind of encapsulates the several questions that we asked about COVID. 
Um, we threw three or four questions into the survey that were designed to gauge their comfort level in writing, to gauge what UTA could do to make them feel more comfortable, and to uh, determine how aware they were of, of the things that we were doing. Um, and so we did see that there was some discomfort or, or concern about uh, potentially writing transit during this time, as we have mentioned. Um, and and um, as Mandy mentioned, the things they mentioned uh, that we could do to make them feel more comfortable, cleaning, disinfecting, social distancing, hand sanitizer, we were doing all of those things. Um, but we did realize that there was not uh, the greatest awareness about the things that we were doing. Um, and probably a couple of reasons for that. Um, we did do a, a campaign in Q2 of um, uh, 2020, shortly after the pandemic hit. We shifted gears a little bit to be responsive, um, but that was in Q2 and the survey again was done six months later. Um, but also as we stated, people weren't looking for the information. They had really stopped writing and it was clear through the focus groups and through the survey that without that need to ride, um, they weren't um, seeking our, um, our information at that time. So this kind of looks at, uh, kind of encapsulates um, uh, what we heard um, from people in December um, about the pandemic. And, and we'll talk in a couple of minutes about how we responded to that. Next slide, please. Andrea, I had a quick question. Um, sure. Did we, um, did any of these questions ask about our um, our RideUTA.com slash recovery um, web page that we established as a result of COVID? Were any of them aware of that? Was that a part of the questioning? I just was curious if, if um, because that was where we had kind of correlated all of our data in regards to the safety and, and the pandemic. Yeah, we did not specifically ask about the website. Um, we did have that website. It was more of a broad question about have you seen um, any information about what UTA is doing, you know, uh, regarding safety measures um, from marketing communications or the website, but we did not get into that much detail um, in the telephone survey. We do have, have later questions where we ask them where they would look for information. Um, but uh, again, as we mentioned, um, it was pretty clear throughout that people just weren't really seeking it because they were working from home, they weren't going to school, they weren't going to events and they had no need um, uh, to seek out our information. Um, and just, you know, I mean, we saw that kind of across the board, you know, we've seen it in our ridership. We saw that even um, in, in a little bit of website traffic and social media traffic even, as people were just um, not writing and, and not looking for our information. But, um, and that's again, a little bit why we did the Pulse survey and some other measures earlier this year uh, to kind of prepare us to rebuild and to encourage people to come back. So, um, so going, uh, just going forward, um, in the survey every year, we just ask a general, um, um, you know, what is your overall favorability about the Utah Transit Authority? And this kind of shows uh, the last four or five years and, and uh, just pretty straightforward um, that we're holding steady with about, you know, a two thirds favorability, um, uh, you know, a little group in there who are pretty neutral um, and the unfavorability really um, hasn't changed. Um, and we do kind of track these over several years. We're not necessarily looking for, you know, year to year fluctuations because a lot of these don't change um, uh, in a statistically significant way. Um, but uh, this is very, very positive and our favorability is, is holding very steady despite um, the challenging year and being in a pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, we follow up on this question with asking them if their opinion of UTA has improved, uh, stayed the same, or uh, deteriorated or gotten worse in the past six months. And we try to focus them on six months so we have something that's a little bit more timely and current. Um, and again, um, uh, everything held very, very steady. Um, most opinions really stayed the same. Um, a little bit of improvement um, and, the, and the gotten worse um, uh, stayed about the same over the last few years, but was a little bit of a dip from last year. Um, but it was interesting um, that many of the comments about, we, we then asked them why their opinion improved or, or became worse. Um, and in the improved category, there were comments about the service, uh, new and improved service, like the service we added in August change day of 2019. 
Um, and many of the comments about why has your opinion uh, become worse were more about the pandemic um, and its impacts, not necessarily directed at UTA. So again, a very kind of interesting thing in this uh, unique year to do this survey. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this slide um, is, is, I think, our favorite slide in, in the whole presentation. <laughs> um, it encapsulates a lot of questions that we ask. Um, so you may um, remember us reporting before. We have several questions that are designed about kind of accountability for UTA, uh, favorability, good use of public uh, funds, being responsive and accountable. And then, as I mentioned, one of the objectives is to ask about the overall impressions of our of our main services, bus, tracks, and front runner. Um, and we're showing um, the data from two or kind of the the change uh, from 2017 to this 2020 B survey. Um, as I mentioned, we like to look at trends over time, not necessarily year to year changes. Um, and we look at the trends to see if we're going in the right direction, in a positive direction, if we're not going in, in a good direction, or if we're holding steady. And we're, we were very pleased to see that um, overall, uh, we're going in the right direction, despite a challenging year, um, and, and despite a lot of change and things that have happened in the past several years, um, we are holding steady or improving in all of these uh, key metrics that we test. Um, and many of these were even some uh, multi-year highs. The favorability rating um, of 4.97 was a 10-year high, and the responsiveness and accountability to the public were all-time highs since we even started asking these questions. Um, so I know there's a lot of information on this slide. It kind of covers several questions in the survey, um, but we were encouraged, uh, again, as despite a pandemic, um, and, and despite the unique year that uh, we are moving in the right direction. Uh, next slide, please, if there's no questions. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we do gauge in this survey what things would most encourage people or entice them to ride. And this is very, very consistent um, with what we've seen in past years. Um, but for just a second, I want Mandy to kind of explain we use kind of mean scores um, on this slide, and we want to talk a little bit about um, what, why we do that. Oh, yeah, I, I actually think um, this slide is looking at the top two box, but the mean scores um, would be for that previous slide, looking at all of those. Oh, uh, did I mess up? I apologize. That's okay, but I, sure. can, I can talk about yeah. mean scores all day. That's fine. Um, yeah, so you can see <laughs> here, we're looking at um, something called a top two box. So this is looking at a one to seven scale. So when we say top two, we mean that six and seven, those top two scores. Um, whereas the previous slide was looking at mean scores. Um, and so when, when we look at something like mean scores for those key metrics, um, it, I don't know if you want to go back to the previous slide. Um, to, if you don't mind, I can just talk about, oh, yeah, there you go, perfect. When we look I at mean scores, um, especially when it comes to things like those key metrics, um, it really just helps us make more sense of the data. So rather than looking at, you know, an individual data point or a group of selected data points like the top two box, um, the mean score just gives us that better understanding of the story overall. And as Andrea mentioned, just letting us track those trends over time. Um, so it just gives us that more complete picture of all the scores, um, just the average scores together. Thank you, Matt. I, I apologize for mixing up the slides. <laughs> you go back to the next slide, please. Um, again, so uh, as I was uh, mentioning, what we've seen consistently throughout the years is when we ask people what would encourage them to ride, it's very, very service related. Um, as Mandy said, we've highlighted the top two boxes, which is more, more coverage and routes, um, more evening service or routes or span of service. Um, and even number three is, is more frequency. Um, so this is, this is very, uh, very consistent with what we've seen um, in past years, um, but we kind of continue to ask those questions, ask about traffic. Um, sometimes we get uh, comments about gas prices um, and, and things like that. Um, um, and we, we do ask about air quality, um, which um, is, is an important issue for the Wasatch Front, but again, service still just seems to um, kind of always remain in the top three. Um, next slide, please.
Um, again, so just kind of following up on the slide about perception of the services, primarily bus tracks and front runner. Um, this is pretty straightforward where we're very holding steady and in positive territory. Um, again, using the mean scores. Um, front runner always uh, seems to have a little bit of an edge. Um, but, um, and bus has really seen an improvement over the last uh, four or five years. Um, so a little bit leveling off this year, but uh, still very positive uh, scores in favorable territory. Um, next slide, please. Um, as, as I mentioned, I'm kind of getting back to, uh, back to Beth's comment, although it's not related to the COVID page. Um, we do ask them where they would uh, seek information about UTA services, and the website continues to be keen. Um, obviously, mobile apps, as we've rolled out uh, more mobile apps and tools for customers in the last few years, we are asking about that, um, as well as our customer service um, and printed information. Um, all of these dipped a little bit this year. Um, we suspect, um, although it's an assumption, that it was probably due to, again, people not writing during the pandemic and not really um, seeking out the information. Um, but uh, these results are kind of consistent with what we've seen over the past several years. Next slide, please. So kind of going a little bit back to the COVID and then some of the other themes we thought, uh, saw through the survey that people weren't really um, seeking information. Um, uh, as we mentioned, people had some concern about riding transit during the pandemic. Um, uh, they were not uh, aware of the information or the safety measures and things that we were doing. Um, and so, um, I, as I think if I've talked with you before, we felt we needed to do kind of a reassurance effort and increase that awareness of the things UTA was doing with regarding uh, cleanliness and safety, masks, uh, hand sanitizer, and social distancing. Um, and we wanted to kind of uh, put out an effort that would kind of set the foundation um, to build that confidence and to build that reassurance so that as things started to open up and schools started returning and events started to come back, um, that we would have more positive perceptions and, and have that positive baseline to start encouraging people to come back. Um, and so with that, um, we did a, a campaign earlier this year, which um, if you go to the next slide, uh, uh, Jen will talk about a little bit. Oops, you think after a year, over a year, I would know how to turn off mute. Um, <laughs> so like Andrea said, um, you know, results were in positive territory, but we did see the need to rebuild momentum and get the message out. So. Um, we really wanted to encourage um, and reassure people of the safety measures as they were starting to reevaluate and reconsider uh, post pandemic activity. Um, so we did that through the forged campaign, which included uh, broadcast TV, um, digital, mobile. Uh, website and even um, use our rider insider email communications to reach um, our riders um, and the public. So with that, we followed up with a pulse survey to ensure that message was um, reached by the intended or to the intended audience. And so we can go to the next slide if there are any questions. Thank you. Jim. Uh, so as we previously mentioned, we did something unique this year after the December survey and then this campaign. And we did a, a shorter uh, follow-up survey in April of this year. This was an online survey only. It did not include telephone. Um, but again, we were targeting about 600 surveys um, in, in, our, uh, in our four county area. And again, looking for that balance of, uh, of demographics. Um, so that was just done in April of 2021. And you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so some of the highlights from, um, we're still kind of digesting the full results, but some of the key takeaways uh, that we're able to report now um, is, um, is our favorability actually saw a little bit of a bump from December. Um, the earlier slides showed that we were 66% favorability back. Um, and then we did this campaign, uh, still kind of focusing on, on safety and reassurance, uh, but we saw a little bit of a bump. So that was um, very, very um, encouraging to us. Um, um, on the heels of this campaign, but just um, just four months um, after the December survey. Um, next slide, please. 
And to, to demonstrate um, the movement we saw, so we did ask uh, whether they had seen the messaging um, and if we had uh, kind of moved the needle at all with respect to people being aware of the safety measures we were taking on the system. And we saw a pretty notable movement here. So um, um, on the earlier slide, only about 29% had, had seen our messaging. Um, this bumped up to, to 39% in the April Pulse survey. And then um, conversely, 68% um, uh, said they had not seen our messaging and that dropped down to uh, just under 50%. So we were very encouraged by that, that people saw the messaging, they saw the campaign and it, and it really moved the needle, not only in the awareness about our COVID safety messaging, but even going back to the previous slide with the underlying um, favorability about the organization as a whole. Uh, so those are some key highlights. And as I mentioned, we're still kind of digesting the full results of that of that Pulse survey, um, but we'll be using it to kind of guide some of our communications going forward. Um, and then next slide, um, Jen will talk about some of those highlights and we'll wrap up. Yeah, again, we're seeing uh, great results in um, people reporting they feel UTA is reliable, safe, um, easy, um, you know, clean and comfortable, um, friendly are, are behind that. Um, and the next slide shows more positive um, information too, that uh, many report that UTA um, is a great benefit for students, the community, commuters, and the environment. Um, so with all this, um, you know, it's able to help fuel our recovery efforts and marketing communications plans through the summer and fall. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it back over to Andrea to wrap it up. No, thank you. Um, I know there, there's a lot of information here. I'm happy to take any questions, but I've, I've talked a lot uh, during um, COVID that we've kind of been looking at this. Uh, we've we've distilled it down into more detail, but we've kind of looked at three main uh, phases of communication. Um, the first last year was right after the pandemic hit, kind of our response messaging. And then earlier this year, we had our kind of our, reassur our reassurance theme, excuse me, uh, messaging. And now we're looking at recovery. Um, and so this, this survey and then the Pulse survey that was specific to COVID, um, we're, we're using this data to help develop messaging um, and campaigns, as, as Jen mentioned, this summer and into the fall to uh, to uh, be more positive and encourage people to come back to transit with that foundation we built with our with our safety measures and um, building awareness and confidence about what we were doing. Um, and that uh, next slide concludes our report on the survey, unless there are any questions. And I know we've gone over time. I appreciate your your uh, patience. Andrea, one, one question I had, and first of all, thank you uh, for all your efforts. Um, and it is good to see some of those numbers uh, improve and and the um, and the messaging that took place. I go back to uh, I can't remember. You know, you had classification of different groups, and it was the non-writer group, and um, and uh, they kind of looked at us. It, I'm, I'm overstating this, I'm sure, but like like in the same category as chip cashing business. And I, as I read through that, I thought to myself, how do we break into the non-writer group at least and how they view UTA, even if they're not using it. And, um, and you know, because I, it looks like from the figures that when the circumstances change, the writers will probably return in large part, mm -hmm. but, as you look down the road toward future ridership, how do you break into that non-rider group a little bit and then mm -hmm. sort of shifting their image of us? No, I, I appreciate that question. I'll, I'll give a couple of comments and then um, uh, Andy, with respect to the, to the research methodology itself, feel free to add anything. Um, it, it's, it's good to remember, as we said, focus groups are, are qualitative. It's, it's comments from 17 people. Um, and again, we use those to see if anything really highlights or you know, rises to the top that we need to address. You know, in past years, we've seen themes like, you know, safety or, you know, or cleanliness or things like that. And we've used those to, um, you know, kind of work with the organization or work with our messaging to make improvements and see if we can move that needle. So it is qualitative information. 
And we balance that with kind of what we see in the telephone and online survey where we do have a positive favorability rating. But it is a good point. I mean, a, a, a foundation of our communications and advertising strategy is to always look to maintain that base of public support, including non-riders, in addition to the people that ride us. Um, so that's something we're continually looking at, um, continually working on. Um, and we've seen fluctuations in the responses of the focus groups from year to year. So it is kind of one of those things that you 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 make note of. You see if it's a common theme, um, and then we work to or we work to address it. Yeah, and and I you know I can really just um, add on to that if that's okay. That you know, as um, Andrea mentioned, we are still digesting a lot of this data that we got in our mid-year pulse. Um, so there were definitely some questions that we included that um, weren't here in this presentation, but some of those included a battery of questions about what would motivate people to ride. So we do have some of that on the back end that, again, we're still reading through, but, you know, a lot of it comes down to things like um, it could even be price discounts, it could be the service thing we talked about, it could be, um, you know, just easier route planning. So I think when we start to go through that data a bit more and and look at our you know current riders versus our non-riders or even our lapsed riders and start to tease apart those differences about what would motivate them to ride and we can really incorporate that into our strategy and messaging moving forward to hopefully see some movement on that end yeah um i'd also like to add something really quickly if there's time but um you know we're also looking at you know, who is that next generation of ridership um you know salt lake the salt lake area in utah um, has an incredibly low uh, unemployment rate, but the job market is um, really hot right now. A lot of people are moving into the area. The demographics are changing um, and we're keeping an eye on that and who those people are. Um, a lot of them are coming from transit dependent cities um, and use you know, transit um, you know, in their daily routines. So we'll be looking at that, including um, you know, even Gen Z and the you know that next generation of ridership, their motivations um, through some secondary research as well. So we'll likely see some of those. Answer, answer your question, Chair Christensen. Yeah, I mean it. It starts to anyway, and I realize <laughs> as you analyze some of your data, um, it just seems like that's a huge market of non-consumption, and and you know mm -hmm. I, I'm under no sort of illusion that we'll gather, you know, a majority of that, but even, you know, a fourth or an eighth of that group would be a pretty significant increase for us down the road. Yep. And I think as, as we've talked about some of the uh, ridership recovery campaigns of things we're planning, um, they are targeted to that next generation of riders and, and to new riders, not just bringing back previous riders. So we're yeah. specifically focused on that. Let's see. I, Beth, you look like you had a question, maybe. I, I do. Thank you. Um, I did just um, have a question about we had in, in my head, we had these three types of, of people, the non-riders, the, the riders, and then there's that COVID piece. Um, I, I know I'm, I'm simplifying it a great deal, but I'm just curious if we ever do something that follows those riders from year to year. Um, or, you know, takes into account some of those elements. Um, it could certainly be most beneficial, I think, to kind of follow up with the non-riders and say, you know, has anything in your circumstances changed? Do you still feel the same way? And then the COVID riders in terms of, you know, do you feel safer now? Has has social distancing still impacting your life, et cetera? I, I know you guys are better at those questions specifically than I am, but uh, understanding maybe is there value in having more of that particular person's um, impacts and calculated, or is it just not feasible? By following the members of, of, of the, the the focus groups individually, year to year, year to yeah. year. Um, I mean, we have done that historically. We you know we do new focus groups every year. Um, and and again, uh, we we caught some of that in, in the poll survey, but that's uh, I mean that's a really interesting question <laughs> that we get. I don't know, Mandy, have, have we ever done anything like that before? Follow um, individual? Not, not for um, Utah Transit Authority, I don't believe. But a longitudinal study like that um, is definitely possible. You know, 
Um, we've done some studies where we do online ethnographies and basically follow people over, you know, a set period of time and kind of check in with them periodically. So that type of methodology is definitely in the realm of possibility. And um, if it's something we're interested in, we can definitely explore. I, I, I think that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not at your guys' expertise level in this build, but I'm just... I'm wondering if it can help to nuance some of our uh, communications pieces if we have a greater understanding. And I think you can get that by having a year over year. So that was just my question. So thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate all the data. It is a lot of data and um, we I, I think it's great. And we probably want to make sure we're using it so that we can do these messaging pieces uh, moving forward. Oh, no. Thank you, Trustee Holbrook. Other questions? Yeah, I have, I have a follow-up question, but I'll, I'll ask it uh, at another time. I'll just reach out to you. And it's in reference to the airport and the, the people going to the airport. Uh, may, that might be a bigger market than what we're taking advantage of right now. So just a okay. thought. No, ha happy to follow up. Yeah. And any other questions, though? It is good to see the progress that BUS seems to be making. So and that, that's encouraging. Well, good. Well, thank you uh, for the update on the, um, on the benchmark survey. And, and uh, we'll look forward to more discussions to come. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, would note in our other business, uh, our next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, June the 9th uh, of 2021. And uh, we... Uh, at nine o'clock. We do have uh, today, however, a closed session uh, for a strategy session to discuss pending or reasonably imminent uh, litigations that will be held on another virtual platform. Uh, with that, uh, um, I would entertain a motion to go into a closed session. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we go into closed session. I will second that. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Okay. We'll be we'll be back uh, uh, hopefully shortly. Thank you. We've returned from our closed session, and uh, as we uh, close our session again, we extend our condolences and our heartfelt to our transit family um, at the Santa Clara uh, the Valley uh, Transit Authority, or VTA, and, and we understand um, eight casualties and at this point, and our, um, certainly our thoughts are with them and their loved ones. With that, I would entertain a, or a motion for adjournment. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion that we adjourn. Uh, I'll second that. I have a motion from Beth, seconded by Jeff. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion passes. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, staff, for all. Great job. Thank you.